<laughs> so, I mean, yeah. I guess we can just jump right into you telling us. Uh, the, the one yeah. thing that really interested me is how you met Ephraim. How did that whole thing get started? Right. So I met Ephraim in synagogue, of all places. Uh, we're bo- we both grew up as uh, Orthodox Jews. Very re- For people who don't know, it's the very religious form of Judaism, mm-hmm. which insists you go to synagogue three times a day, every day. And uh, neither of us really like to pray because... Uh, praying is boring in, in, uh, uh, unless you're really into it. Um, because Orthodox prayers is not like, like where you just close your eyes and you ask God for whatever it is that you want, or, you know, it's like a little personal therapy session with God. It's not like that. It's, you have to read a specific prayer from a book in a certain way. You have to stand up for this part and sit down for that part. And, and you do the same exact thing three times a day. Uh, well, it's different prayers each time, but the same, the same prayers you pray every day. So we would both sneak out of synagogue on Sabbath and go hang out on the basketball courts and, um, uh, try to kill time. And, um, the other kids who didn't like to pray, which is most of them also would sneak out. And, uh, he's actually four years younger than me. And in the movie, they say we're the same age, but he's actually four years younger than me. And I was friends with guys who were two years younger than, than me. And they were friends with him. And they thought he was very entertaining because he loved playing pranks. So um, Orthodox Jews have this, uh, um, uh, they have to wear the, the kippah, they mm. call it, on the head. And the rule is, is that you're not allowed to walk more than four steps without it. So um, what he would love to do is he'd love to sneak up, Ephraim would love to sneak up behind other, behind like religious uh, guys and, and like steal their kippahs and go run away from them because he knew that they couldn't chase him more than like four steps. What, what do they do in that situation? Um, what they would use, so usually they would just cover their heads and that would be a technical uh, like loophole and then they would go and eventually just catch him mm. uh, and then beat him up and uh, take their kippah back and then they'd put it back on their heads and walk away and he'd sneak up behind them and steal it again. Mm. The guy, he would, he was he was fearless uh, ever since he was a kid. He just had no sense of fear or uh, uh, sense of risk, which I guess kind of played out in uh, the way he did things later on in life. Mm. But uh, for my, better or for worse, yeah, for better yeah. and worse. That's kind of how how things go. But that's how I got to know him and um, uh, became friends with him. And then when he was 16 years old, he got kicked out of high school because he got caught smoking weed. Mm. Um, And uh, we both went to religious Jewish high schools, but we went to different ones. So we weren't in the same school. Was that in Miami? Yeah, yeah. It was in Miami. Uh, There's two uh, Orthodox Jewish high schools in Miami. We each went to one of them. Mm. Um, And um, uh, so he got he caught smoking weed and he got kicked out of of school. And his parents said, well, if you're not going to take school seriously, we're going to put you into the workforce so you know what real life is like. And they sent him off to his uncle in L.A. to work for his uncle. His uncle owned a big pawn shop and, uh, in South Central L.A. Uh, because his, um, uh, his dad, uh, his uncle's dad, Ephraim's grandfather, is a uh, real estate billionaire and who owned a huge amount of, uh, of uh, South Central L.A., which is the slums of LA. And so he set his son up, uh, Ephraim's uncle, uh, with a big uh, property in South Central LA, and he started this pawn shop business. And uh, one of the things, of course, pawn shops sell is guns. And Ephraim got obsessed with guns as a teenage boy. Hmm. And he started learning everything about them. And he um, started interacting with the people who came into the store to sell them guns. And then he realized a lot more business is done online than in in the retail shops. So he started going online to the gun boards um, where people were buying and selling guns. And he um, started doing that business. Uh, And his uncle was uh, bidding on local police, local and state police uh, contracts to sell them guns and various accessories. And so he, uh, he learned from his uncle how to bid on government contracts uh, through this process. Worked for his uncle for about two years. And then uh, Ephraim claims that his uncle screwed him out of like 70 grand 
his uncle claims Ephraim screwed him out of 70 grand. I personally believe both of them, right? Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Well, so you think they, it was a mutual? Well, I, I don't know who screwed who, mm. but I will say that they're both the types to screw each other. Mm. So Because his uncle also has a pretty bad reputation in the industry uh, for shady business. I, I've never dealt with his uncle personally, so I can't say I know specifically, but I've read comments online okay. like, oh, you know, this guy. So how long was Ephraim bidding contracts, specifically yeah. in guns, before you guys teamed up? So he was working with his uncle for two years, um, and then he moved back to Miami and uh, started his own company. He was actually 17 at the time when he came back to Miami, so he wasn't even 18. So when he, he was bidding do, the contracts? Yeah, so he, what he did was he took over his dad's company, AEY Inc., okay, which, which, which makes it into the movie. The infamous. Uh, yes, the infamous AEY <laughs> Inc., which does stand for something, unlike what they say in the I movie. Was, really? Yeah. Really? Uh, we'll yeah. Get, get the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's one of my favorite parts yeah, of That's yeah. a great line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, in uh, what AEY actually does stand for is the initials of uh, three of his father's sons. So okay. it's Avrami, Ephraim, okay. Yeshaya. So, so the E in AEY is Ephraim. Mm. That's, that's his initial. Oh, okay. And the A and the Y are his two brothers. So his dad had started the company like four or five years beforehand and originally used it as like a label printing business. And then it just went dormant and he didn't use the company to do anything. It was doing nothing with it. Uh, so at, when Ephraim came to Miami, he took over the company, um, you know, the, the company structure, so to speak, um, and started doing, uh, he registered the company, uh, with the federal government to, uh, to do business with the feds. And, uh, and he did everything under his dad's name cause he was still 17 years mm -hmm. old at the time. So he wasn't legally really supposed to be doing anything under his own name. And, um, uh, started do bidding on government contracts and worked on his own for about a year uh, before we bumped into each other at a mutual friend's house. We were smoking weed, of course, and uh, he asked me. It wasn't at a funeral. It wasn't at a funeral. It was not at a funeral. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was not at a funeral. Um, it, we, we were just at a mutual friend's house smoking weed, and uh, well, I guess they needed something more exciting in the movie yeah. than and, and that. And you guys had been disconnected for a while. Yeah, we hadn't seen each other for a few years yeah. at that point. Uh, we were we were like friends when we were younger, but we weren't like best friends. Mm. Um, you didn't we used just to watch had, Scarface. Yeah, I mean, we did like Scarface. We did <laughs> watch it, you know. I mean, but like everyone that age yeah, yeah. does. Uh, so, uh, I was I was gonna ask. You know yeah. the laugh that he has in the movie. He that does not have that laugh. <laughs> yeah, no. no, he doesn't. <laughs> <have>. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of creative liberties. Oh, in that yeah, 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 yeah. No, he does not laugh like that. Um, Jonah Hill made that up because he wanted to give him mm. a little bit more character. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, he doesn't have that annoying laugh. He has plenty of other annoying uh, personal <laughs> personality habits, but uh, that's I heard, not one of them. Yeah, I heard they had yeah. to tone him down a little bit, and Ephraim was a lot worse than Jonah Hill had. He in the day. was a much worse of a person than Jonah Hill portrayed him in the movie. People ask me, oh, was Ephraim like as crazy in real life as he was in the movie? And I, I say that he actually was way crazier in real life. Mm -hmm. Like he was much more of a nice guy in the movie, a much more likable person in the movie than he was in real life. In real life, um, he's he liked, he kind of got off on annoying people. Mm. So he... One, uh, one crazy example, um, I, uh, I actually wasn't there for this one, a friend of mine, because this was after I, we already had our falling out, um, and he was awaiting to get sentencing, and he really went off the deep end at that point in his life when he already had pled guilty. He was um, waiting to get sentenced. He, st he started to uh, do lots of drugs, lots of prostitutes, mm. and, and lots of gambling also, and he must have spent millions of dollars in like that like year year and a half period and this was after the fact yes of, this was this was after we had already had our falling out yeah. and he was waiting to get sentenced by the judge mm -hmm. so before he went to prison mm -hmm. and um one of my friends we still had mutual friends and they were hanging out with him in south beach and and uh he got wasted as he did every night and they got into a cab and while the guy's driving down the street, Ephraim uh, reaches up behind the cab driver and covers his eyes. 
what? Goodness. Yeah, and the guy's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And Ephraim's like, just drive, motherfucker, drive. What? You oh, know? Man. He's like, I'll tell you, I'll give you a hundred bucks right now if you just keep on driving. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. What? <laughs> like, fucking insane. Oh, wow. Where was yeah. this? What? Where was? Where this was this? in South Beach. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Goodness. This is just driving. Wow. And the guy, like, stops the car in the middle of the road. Everyone's honking at it. He's like, mm. what the fuck are you doing? You know? Oh, so that's just the type yeah. of guy you are. He, yeah. he, he was thrived com- on chaos. No Comple- regard. Completely fearless, loved chaos, mm, mm. loved to get under people's skin. Wow. You know, uh, one scene in the movie where he gets punched out by Dan Blazarian, mm. right? Where after, like, he's hitting on Dan's girl, though. Mm. In the movie, it looks like he didn't know it was Dan's girl, right? In real life, what he would do is he would walk up to, like, a couple in a club, like, who are, like, you know, obviously together. And he'd walk up to, like, the girl, and he'd be, and he'd, like, take her hand, and he'd be like... Come with me, baby. This guy's a loser. <laughs> Has it ever worked? Just like That's that. That's wild. No, never. Of course okay. not. It never worked. Yeah. Okay, it never. sure. Yeah, no, it never worked. But it did get him into a whole lot of fights that I'm I had sure. to get him out That's of. Wild. So, yeah. yeah, it got really, really annoying because every time we'd go out, I'd have to, like, pull him out of a fight. And I'm like, I don't want – this is not fun for me. You know, yeah. like, this is not – I'm not, like, a fighting kind right. of guy. I don't want to get in – I don't go out – to get into fights, mm-hmm. but he obviously did. Yeah. Um, so, so kind of yeah. going back to how you guys reconnected. Yeah. So you, you, right. you were at a party or a house smoking yeah. weed, and right. So we were, so we were at my at our mutual friend's house. We were smoking weed, and he asks me, uh, you know, what are you doing these days? And at the time, I was going to college. I was uh, I was studying chemistry, um, and I was working part time as a massage therapist. That part's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also had a few online businesses that I was that I was doing. I was selling SD cards that I was buying from China, and uh, selling them on eBay. That was doing pretty well. I was also um, doing bulk shipments of bed sheets so and that towels. Was true. That part is true. However, what was the count? Yeah, it's <laughs> actually so. Institutional use, they actually want lower thread counts sure. because they want it to be cheaper. So, uh, so it is true in the movie that the institution doesn't care about the high thread counts for for their uh, for their old people, as they it, say. They Nobody say? cares about old people, right? <laughs> putting like silk putting on a, a lizard. Yeah, yeah, a, a, a cashmere, wrapping cashmere a lizard, lizard in cashmere. That that was the line. That was Have the you line. Ever felt yeah. their skin. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, but what uh, the way the business actually was, I wasn't going door to door like they show in the movie trying to sell bed sheets I already bought and was taking up all the room in my apartment. You know, that, that was how they portrayed it in the movie. And, and how it actually was is I was just brokering deals. So yeah. uh, Would I it had be drop shipping. Not exactly because uh, the way I did it was I was. I was uh, selling to distributors in the United States who would then sell to the to all the facilities Mm. and I would only do an order if I already got an order so I was literally just being a broker okay Um, so I'd get an order for X number of bed sheets and towels and then I'd talk to my manufacturers put the order together do the shipping do a uh, transferable letter of credit so that I didn't even have to finance it Mm. Um, and uh, and just collect the the fee in between and so i never got stuck with a whole bunch of bed sheets i did have some samples that they sent me so i did have a few boxes of bed sheets and towels and uh my ex who is played by anna de armas loves to exaggerate that oh yeah our t- apartment was filled with bed sheets and towels <laughs> yeah, it's not actually true That's uh, a, yeah. so you're making money with with this you're making yeah no i was money. doing all right i when, was doing when all right. you met yeah, when I was Ephraim. when when I met okay. Ephraim, I was actually I wasn't making like a huge amount of money, but I was more than comfortable. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you weren't broke. No, I was not broke. Okay. They they like in the movie. Yeah. yeah, in the movie they try to do the rags to riches sure, story, sure, which sure. is a much. I mean, everyone loves that. Everyone loves that, and it was a it's a much better dramatic arc. Uh, you know, the 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 lower you start from, the cooler it is, the higher you get, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but it, but in real life, I was. I wasn't like rich or anything. I wasn't like you rolling in the dough. I was comfortable. Okay. I was comfortable. Um, and, uh, but of course, who doesn't want more, right? Sure. So, uh, so I told Ephraim about, you know, all the businesses I was doing and he was like, oh, you know, that's actually really, that's really cool. That's, uh, you're doing a lot of the similar things of what I do in my business. You know, you're searching for suppliers, you're arranging logistics, you're uh, setting up financing, uh, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. And, but I bet you I'm making way more money than you. So, uh, you know, I'm actually looking for a partner and, you know, I know you're a smart guy. You work hard. So, uh, what do you think about coming to 
work with you know work with me and i said well how much money i'm making <laughs> <laughs> and he said he's like you know what i'm gonna tell you but not because i'm bragging just to inspire you okay and so he opens up he had his laptop he opens up his laptop and he logs into his bank of america account and he shows me his Bank of America account, and it had $1.8 million of cash in the bank. Just in a checking account? In a checking wow. account. Well, a money market account, sure, but yes. Sure. Yeah. yeah. He was, of course, he collects every tiny Absolutely. bit of interest yeah, of he can, as you, as you should. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and he's like, and this isn't all my money, because I got money on deals, you know, um, d m deals are coming in. I've got, you know, deposits on other deals, but, you know, this is what I've got and, in the and bank And what now. year was this, sorry? This was in late 2005. Oh, wow. So he yeah. had been in the business for... So he'd been on his own. He's been on the business without his uncle for about a year. Wow. So he and was doing that kind of money in he one was year. Doing, he made a few million dollars in his first year. That's, in his that's first wild. Year. And was he in yeah. the government contracting arena or was it um, more local contracts? So he made all that money from the federal contracting Got because it. this was 2005 was a huge explosion in federal contracting because this was right after the uh, invasion of, of Iraq mm -hmm. in 2003, and then they bombed Iraq into nothing, and, and then they decided to build a democratic country from the ground up, and part of that was building all these institutions up, like the army and the police, mm -hmm. and they had to arm them. The and, foundation of and every to, government. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, hey, you know, without a, a monopoly on violence, a yeah, state exactly. is not a state. That's, yeah. that's what makes a state. So, uh, so yeah, so, and if, because, uh, um, uh, and it, as they mentioned in the movie, actually, the, there was a big scandal with uh, Dick Cheney, who was the vice president at the time for George Bush. He w used to be the CEO of Halliburton before he became vice president. Halliburton was a very big defense contractor. And uh, coincidence, coincidence, got a huge, like, multi-billion dollar contracts um, without happened? any bidding hmm. process. Yeah. Sole source awarding. And all his friends uh, invested in the company exactly. beforehand. And, and he, I believe Dick Cheney still had a bunch of stock. Yeah, sure. It was a whole... He deserved it, I'm sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. No idea that was going to happen before that. Right, exactly. So it created, of course, a big scandal. And so they instituted... Uh, they already had a, a, a small business program, but they really increased its mm -hmm. visibility and its uh, dollar amounts that they were putting towards small business mm -hmm. to kind of deflect that whole thing. So that directed billions and billions of dollars towards small business and he was very aggressive at bidding on these contracts and he started winning quite a bit of them uh and he did really well and um and so you know i saw that I, I i was blown away of course and uh uh i was like this guy yeah exactly <laughs> i was he, he he was 18 years old at the time yeah that's and incredible. He, and he had millions of dollars that I knew he made it himself. Like I knew that it wasn't like his parents gave him the money because I knew his parents and his grandfather is a billionaire, but his grandfather is one of those billionaires who gives no money to anybody, including mm. his own family. Mm. Um, in fact, his grandfather uh, got into the uh, newspapers because he was part of, I think, the biggest alimony lawsuit of uh, in history. Uh, because after, I think, 40 years of marriage to his grandmother, they decided to get divorced. And it turned out they, they were married for like 40 years. They had like eight or nine kids together, Orthodox Jewish family. Sure. You know, they have large families. And, uh, and then it turns out when his grandmother tried to divorce his grandfather that they had never been legally married. They were just religiously married. And mm. according to, I think, in the laws of California, unless it's legally married, you get nothing. Oh, wow. And she tried to get alimony, and he's like, I'm giving you zero. Whoa. Wow. Yeah, after 40 years of marriage. This was the billionaire. This is the billionaire. Oh, he want, tried to give his ex-wife zero. So these and are the genes that Ephraim comes from. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's, um, it's harsh. Yeah. Yeah, harsh is... <laughs> to say putting it least. mildly, yes. So his grandmother sued his grandfather for, I think, $700 million. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and I don't know how the case ended up. I think they might have settled it out of court. But, um, but yeah, but it got into the newspapers Jeez. that it was the largest alimony lawsuit of all time. So, yeah. So his grandfather 
is not a generous guy. <laughs> it did uh, not come from him. It did not come okay. from him. Uh, he did set his uncle up in business, and according to Ephraim, his uncle lost money consistently every year, mm. and his grandfather kept on bailing him out, so I guess he was generous with at least one of his mm. sons. Um, but yeah, but I knew that his grandfather didn't give him the money, and uh, so I knew he had earned it, and that that blew my mind. I'm like, yeah, I'm doing all right with my businesses, but I'm not making millions of dollars in a year. Sure. Um, and I didn't think I was going to. Um, so I said, okay, let's do this. I'm, I'm, I'm sufficiently impressed. Right there, <laughs> and, right and then and inspired, there. yeah. On the spot. Yeah. And I at said, that point, it was just the two of you guys. He yeah, was, was working just on his two. own and he brought you on. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so we started working out of his apartment. Uh, at the time, he, ha- he was uh, living in this... Even though he had millions of dollars, he was living in this tiny little one bedroom kind of shitty apartment that was like part of someone else's house mm-hmm. that, that had, you know, it was like a, like an extra room they were mm-hmm. renting to him. And he drove this kind of like beat up car. And I was like, you know, why are you living like this? You have millions of dollars. And he's like, I don't give a shit about that. I just care about the money. I'm like, well, what's the money for? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, and did you yeah. leave your other businesses? But did you just drop them and walk away? Or did so you? I still did uh, the. I stopped doing massages. Sure. Because, you know, <laughs> of course. Yeah, because that's just it's it's a big time sink. Um, I actually enjoyed doing massages. And mm-hmm. He he would love to make fun of me for doing massages <laughs> as in in the movie. In the movie as, as well. That, yeah, yeah. That that part's accurate. I'm he, sure he, that he would love to. He he loved David to make fun of me. David used to jerk guys off for yeah, money. Yeah, fact. Yeah. <laughs> Not a fact, by the way. Just not a fact. Uh, so yeah, I did have gay clients, and the whole towel thing did happen. I was gonna. No ask. way. Yeah, yeah, that happened. That and, happened. And what a beautiful apartment that was. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was a very nice apartment. We, um, yeah. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the towel thing has happened to me before, but, um, but not, but very, very, very rarely. Like I've had like, That's I've bold. had a lot of gay clients because I was working in South beach and yeah. like half of South beach is gay. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, uh, and I was, you know, a young cute guy and I guess I was popular in the gay community, but, uh, um, but they were all very respectful mm-hmm. and I'd never had problems with anybody that like I've always I've only had like maybe two or three times that anyone has ever like come on to me at all and that was like in a very and like the second I said no they were like oh I'm so sorry you know and it wasn't like aggressive in any way um but yeah but yeah but that the towel thing did happen Mm. I I, I can confirm yeah (laughs) so (laughs) yeah so when you guys teamed up how long what did it take for you to get your first contract so um, it, by the time I won the first contract, it was two to three months. Mm-hmm. And yeah. what were you doing in that two to three months? How yeah. did it like begin? So, so the way we originally started was, uh, it was actually not on government contracting at all. Um, because I had, uh, because I was buying SD cards, uh, from China and this was, this was the time when, um, when uh, the the original Xbox came out, and it was being it was moving like it was all sold out everywhere. Uh, all the stores were completely out of stock, and one of my connections from the SD cards said, "Hey, you know, uh, we have connections to buy a bunch of Xboxes." And I said, "Well, definitely interested because that's a very in demand item." And uh, they wanted. To, I forgot the exact numbers at this point, but they wanted to, to uh, they were like, the minimum order quantity is like a thousand units or something. And I didn't have, what was it, like $200,000 or something, or $300,000 it was to buy it. And uh, so I told Ephraim, like, hey, I've got this offer to buy these Xboxes. Are you interested in coming in on this deal? And so, uh, and that's that was the first thing we worked on. And I have to say, from that experience, I, I saw like how he worked and he was one of the most talented guys to cut through middlemen that I've ever seen. Right. So he talked to the guy I was talking to. Turned out that guy was a middleman. He got connected to his middleman and then he got through five layers of middlemen. And I don't know how he convinced them. No to, reimbursement. He just. No, no. He told he told. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're give, Everyone's going to get it. Okay. He didn't pay anyone up front, yeah, but course. he said, I'll give you a cut. You know, we put it in writing, whatever, you know. So he got he made the deal with them to get connected to their to their uh, source. And uh, but usually middlemen are very, very skeptical and very uh, hesitant 
to give you their source because that's all they've got yeah. is their source, right? That's their leverage. But exactly, that's the whole thing. Uh, but he managed to convince every layer of middleman all the way up through like five different layers. That's impressive. It was. It, he was extremely, extremely uh, uh, talented um, at convincing people to do things. He's uh, very, very good at negotiating, very good at talking people into things. He talked me out of all the millions of dollars that he owed me. So, yeah. Uh, so when seeing this, did you... Did it ever occur to you that, okay, this could be me in the future? Were you thinking about that when you were in the beginning stages? So in, in the beginning, I, I mean, I was just wanted to do this Xbox deal. Yeah. And uh, I knew that he had a bunch of money, and, uh, and I needed the money to do this deal. So I figured, use him as financing to do the deal. And then, but then he started talking to the, to the suppliers, and he started going through the different layers of middlemen and each layer, the minimum order quantity got bigger until eventually it was like 10,000, they wanted to sell 10,000 units. And the, the uh, final source that we got to, it was a large um, uh, electronics distribution company, which is what makes me think that it might have been real. Right, because at first it was just a bunch of random Chinese sources, and eventually we got connected to a large uh, electronics distribution company, and it was their email address. It wasn't fake, and um, but they wanted to sell ten thousand units, and we needed like twenty million dollars for that. And he, so we started searching for investors. I remember him getting on the phone with. Uh, with a uh, hedge fund from New York, and he says to them, he's like, gentlemen. Uh, I need $20 million and I'm 18 short. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this is where you come in. And, uh, unfortunately we couldn't line up the financing because even though the deal was set up so that it, it should have been safe, it was going to be done through a letter of credit. Um, which means that nobody would get paid until the goods were inspected and, uh, you know, by our inspectors, which means that they wouldn't be able to just steal the money. It would be held in escrow by the bank. That's what, what a letter of credit is. Uh, so even though the payment uh, was pretty solid, um, it just didn't pass the smell test for the hedge fund because they're like, everyone's out of stock why are these 10,000 units sitting here? What are they, why aren't they going through the normal channels? Microsoft has their, um, Microsoft has their, uh, their official distribution channels and they, will, they won't be happy selling it outside of those channels. So how did these guys get 10,000 units? And it's a good question. I've wondered about that myself. And one of the theories is, is that it was a, production overrun, right? So the so Microsoft doesn't own the factories in China, right? neither does Apple. They hire Foxconn or whoever it is to do the manufacturing for them. Now, one thing that Chinese manufacturers are infamous for doing, especially back then, they do it less so these days, but um, they're particularly infamous for doing it back then, is they'll take your product and they'll do the manufacturing for you, but then they'll make a bit extra, mm -hmm. right? Like 10% extra. And then they'll sell it secretly, like through eBay, or through the black market or, or whatever to guys like us. And so the hedge fund was thinking probably that this is the situation and they didn't want to risk getting sued by Microsoft for buying uh, unauthorized products. Sure. I'm not exactly sure what the legality of that is. I assume that, you, that it would be considered stolen goods because they're manufacturing without the consent of the original manufacturer if that was the actual case, in which case the goods could get impounded it could there could be a whole bunch of ways that that deal can that you could lose your 18 million dollars that you put in sure, with this sure. with this yeah. uh random guy from miami mm. so the whole deal collapsed and and, and sorry who, who was the purchaser uh oh so we so we actually got walmart and target to agree to take the entire uh quantity at the at the sales price and, so and at how the did retail you, price how did you get that yeah. deal how did you acquire that deal you mean the to to sell it to them yeah we just called them up got to, Ephraim was very is very good wow. at the phone <laughs> yeah this i i got I, just like he went through different layers of of um of uh 
middlemen. He went through different layers in Walmart and Target, and he just got to the people. That's who, amazing. Yeah, yeah. He just managed to convince them that he was real and that he had access to these units, and if they wanted it, they, they better uh, get someone who can make decisions on the phone right now. Wow. And uh, and he managed to talk to them, and they agreed to take everything, all the units we had, at the at the retail price it was like at four hundred dollars which means we would have like doubled our money we would have made like wow. uh 20 million dollars in profit How if we if this had actually on that? so they were not going to make money loss off leader. it they were going to use it as a loss leader yeah. meaning we've we're the only store that has xboxes come in and while you're here you might as well buy a game for your xbox or an extra accessory mm -hmm. and so they get people in the store when did you guys focus solely on the government contract right so we worked the xbox deal for about two weeks uh, we were working like 18 hour days mm -hmm. uh, on the we xbox were, deal on the xbox deal we were we were working um i pretty much moved into his apartment for that <laughs> for like that period of time uh and that time was spent trying to get to the right people in all the retailers, trying to find financing, to trying to break through various levels of uh, of um, uh, middlemen for the source, and um, and uh, yeah, and then eventually we realized we were not going to fund this deal, and the whole thing fell apart. And Ephraim said to me, he's like, you know, why don't we do a business that I know we can make money on you know my, my bread and butter is government contracting i want you know i made you an offer offer still stands let's let me teach you how to do this and what was that offer the offer so the offer was that i would work um commission only of course no salary right and uh i would do all the like he would teach me what to do i would do all the legwork get it to the point where uh, he would like review the documents before submitting to the government to make sure I did it correctly. And he would do some last minute negotiations with the suppliers and the, and the, um, logistics companies to try to negotiate the price down. Cause he was very good at that. And, um, and he would finance the deal and we would split it 50, 50. That was, that was the deal. And that's pretty fair. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I was very happy with On it. Paper. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I was very happy. If he had actually paid me, I would have been very happy. <laughs> exactly. Um, especially covering funding. That's big. Yeah, exactly. Funding is one of the biggest, uh, issues in government contracting. Yeah, we know. Yeah. So he was exactly. the funding guy. You were the legwork guy. Yeah, exactly. I was the legwork guy. He was the funding, but also the, um, the government, uh, like, um, what do you call it? Paperwork, uh, uh, guy. I mean, I did a lot, like I went as far as I could and then I would say, Hey, I don't understand what this means. And he would say, you know, either he already knew or he would get the contracting officer on the phone and Got get it. that explained and, and et cetera. And of course he knew a whole bunch of tricks of the trade of, to try to increase, uh, margins before and after the fact. So you know, he used that to, to try to increase our profit margins as well. So that was like his role. He would use his expertise. I would do all the all the grunt work, which is like 80, 90 percent of the actual work. And then he would use take it the rest of the way uh, to to get us to maximize our chances of winning and maximize our profit margins if we did win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the first contract that you did federally, was that yeah. in guns? No. So the first contract I won. So at first he said, you know what, why don't you do something that uh, that I'm not focused on. That way we expand the business so we're not like trying to work in the same field. And I, he, he said, I already pretty well versed in the whole guns and, and uh, munitions uh, uh, seg segment. So why don't you do something else? And I found this contract for uh, propane. And I figured fuel, energy is a huge market. And uh, always in constant need of supply, right? It's never, it's a, it's a, what do they call it? A consumable, right? Mm -hmm. So you're always going to need more fuel and, uh, and they consume a lot of it and they consume a huge amount of it. So I figured get into the fuel business. And so, uh, my first, the first contract I won was for 50,000 gallons of propane and it was, uh, uh, delivered it to a air force base in Wyoming in the middle of the winter. They needed it for heating and I made a total of $8,000 on it. Wow. Uh, and how long did that take you to win after you started focusing on that? Uh, so it was about a, um, about a month to a month and a half after the end of the Xbox deal okay. uh, that I won it. Uh, and, uh, and that went great. 
everything went smooth, no problems. And then I started working on a few other things. I worked on uh, a, a deal for SUVs to Pakistan, to the State Department in Pakistan. I got so close to winning that one. I got into the final round where they were doing like the audits. And then unfortunately, it's yeah. so disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to, that, that's that's the business. That's the you, game. Yeah, you have to uh, be willing to lose nine out of 10 times yep. or more. Mm -hmm. But that one time you win, makes all worth it. makes it's up big. for all of it and um then i worked on uh i, I worked on very i worked on a contract for socks i worked on a contract for meals ready to eat mres they give to the soldiers um in the field uh i were and then the, my first gun contract that i worked on was for uh it was a contract that ephraim had won but he didn't want to work on delivering so and the reason for that was because it was a contract for rare gun parts, and it was going to the special forces, um, like to the Green Berets, and they trained the Green Berets and the Navy SEALs on all these uh, outdated weapon systems because they drop them into Afghanistan or into Pakistan or, or Iraq or wherever, and oftentimes they will uh, they need to use whatever weapons are available in the field. And so they need to know how to use those weapons. And oftentimes in those parts of the world, a lot of the weapons that they can come, they come across because they, they always want to train special forces to be as, um, as self-reliant as possible, right? Because they're out there with nobody helping them. So in case they run out of ammo for the weapon they have, or they lose their gun, or they, for whatever reason, due to the mission, they have to go in without a gun and they need to get supplied while in the field, they may come across weapon systems that aren't even being manufactured anymore, like uh, German Lugers from like World War II and, and things like that. So they need to train the, the special forces in all these outdated weapon systems. And so this contract was for all these gun parts, for all these old weapon systems that weren't being manufactured anymore. And it was a huge list of uh, really hard to find parts. Uh, now, Ephraim built, uh, bid it. He knew, because he knows the industry, he knew that this was a huge pain in the ass contract to deliver because it had so many rare parts. And so probably not that many people were going to be bidding on it. So he bid it pretty high. And he didn't even bother to go and get a quote for every single thing because that was just too much work. He just figured, yeah, I can probably get it, someone to sell me if I bid it at this level. So the, so the margins were pretty good. But then he won the contract, but then he had to actually go find all those parts and he didn't want to do all that legwork. So he said, why don't you work on, he said to me, why don't you work on this contract? Um, it's, a, it's a lot of work, but the margins are great. And so I worked on that. It took me like two to three months to deliver everything and um, made about like $30,000 on that. And of, uh, and he said, hey, you know, I'm, uh, we're, we're going to, we're, you know, we're, I was constantly working on new things and, you know, coming close to winning some things, losing others. As you never like work on one stop, then work on another. You're always working on multiple things. And so we were in the process of winning others. And so he owed me like 30, 40 K and he's like, you know, I'm using my money to fund these contracts. So I think it's only fair that you pitch in on the funding. So why don't we just roll your winnings into the next contract? And that was the beginning of me getting screwed out of everything. I said, yeah, that makes sense, you know? Had you, and had you gotten any money out yet? Or was I, had that... got, I got zero. 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 Okay. I'd been working the entire time. And so I trusted him. And I was like, oh, you know, we know each other since we were kids, you know? He's not going to screw me over, right? Uh, even though he's trying to pull shady things on every other person he meets. Um, I guess that's, uh, you, uh, you, you make excuses. <laughs> oh, I'm special, you know. So he's not going to screw me, <laughs> right? Uh, we're best friends. We went to school together. Uh, well, yeah, we did. I mean, at this point, we were getting really close because we were pretty much spending all our time together. Yeah, I was sure. more or less sleeping on his couch uh, for most days of the week. And, yeah, um, partnership is like a marriage. 
Ex- it really in a lot of uh, ways. you you oftentimes spend more time with your partner than you do with your with your you, significant you exactly. absolutely like yeah. Logan and I we've cried we bled together <laughs> argue you oh yeah solve yeah. problems yeah exactly it's, it's like yeah. you're going to war yeah so for I'm, real I'm sure you guys I mean, got extremely close during yeah that time. I mean it's your livelihood is on the line and therefore your life right yeah because you know, your life is your livelihood so. Uh, yeah, we got really, really close uh, uh, because I was pretty much sleeping on his couch. Uh, we'd occasionally, we didn't go out that often because we were so exhausted from working, but occasionally we'd go out and party in South Beach. I'd save him from getting his ass kicked a whole bunch of times. So, it, you know, like usually he'd get really drunk and he'd follow it up with a bunch of cocaine so he could do, so he could drink more and he'd get rowdy and, and I'd save his ass and then he'd be all drunk. He'd be like, David, you're my best friend. Oh, thank you so much. I would they would have kicked my ass so bad. You know, it's a good thing I've got you. You know, and and I'm like, why don't you stop doing that shit? You know, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to save your ass every fucking time. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. So through that process, you know, we got to be really close, and and he started saying at that point he was like, yeah, you're my best friend. And so you're you had developed guy. that trust. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I thought I did. Uh, he, he was definitely talking like my best friend and I believed him. Right. Um, and then, uh, a, a few months after that, uh, in the summer of 2006, um, was when we saw the, uh, we saw the Afghan contract. Um, and he goes to me, he's like, hey, you know, I know that uh, uh, you're mostly focused on the fuel stuff and on some various other things, but this is a huge contract and I really need your help on this. And even though it's my bread and butter and I've got all these sources for, for these uh, items, you know, for, it, was mostly, it was all munitions. It wasn't, it wasn't any weapons. It was all just, uh, um, it, and it ranged everything from like pistol ammo to uh, mortar rounds and tank ammo and, and anti-aircraft rockets. It was a whole thing. And um, the purpose of that contract was to arm the Afghanistans yeah. with, to be able to protect themselves. Yes. So this was in 2006 and it was George Bush's coming towards the end of George Bush's second term. And uh, so he couldn't run again. So, sure. and he was super unpopular at the time. I mean, his r- approval ratings were in the toilet. And so they figured at the time that uh, he's probably that the Republicans, because George Bush was a, re- was a Republican, uh, the Republicans are going to lose the next election, which they were right. Obama won. Uh, and they also thought that, well, the Democrats are talking this whole talk about being anti-war. They're probably going to just. Uh, pull out of Afghanistan as soon as possible uh, and leave the Afghans hanging. And they were wrong about that. Uh, It took until Biden to pull out of Afghanistan. And that was a a big disaster. Right. Um, So uh, so the the plan that George that the Bush administration had was to arm the Afghans to the max so that even if if uh, the next administration pulled out, uh, the Afghans would be good for the next like 20, 30 years. So they, they uh, put out this contract to arm them with these munitions and it was just massive. It was like 30 different items and uh, the total, it was hundreds of millions of AK-47 rounds, like a million grenades, um, tens of thousands of like anti-aircraft rockets. It was just massive, like 20 times bigger than anything we'd ever seen. And a lot of the items we had already delivered to Iraq um, on much, much smaller scale. And so we already had the past performance. Uh, we had the proof that we could deliver these items, which you need for the, uh, for the government to award you these large contracts uh, for you to be eligible to, to, uh, to bid on it. And so we knew we were eligible. And we were like, if we're eligible, we're bidding on this thing. So, uh, but because it was such a huge contract and so many different items, he said, I really need you to work on this. And this is my bread and butter. So we're not going to do the 50-50 thing. We'll do 25%. And I was like, I don't care. You know, I mean, like, this is going to be hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm good with 25%. That's fine. You know, that's fair. And so I started working. He said, you, these are my sources. He gave me like five or six different sources and he's like, don't contact them. I'll contact them because I'm already dealing with them. I want you to go and scour the internet and go as many Google page results deep as you need to until you, until, until you run out and get a quote from every single potential supplier on the planet who are not these 
five people who are I'm going to get uh, quotes from. So I started doing that. A lot of the sources are in Eastern Europe, so I had to stay up all night. Get A lot of them don't have email addresses, so I had to get them on the phone. They don't speak English, so I had to find someone there who speaks English. I would just say, English, English, English. Look, Nyet, nyet, nyet. No, English. Nyet. Ah, da, da, English. Okay. So, and then they would get the one guy who would spoke like five sentences in English. And, um, and pretty much I would get their, their fax. No, they do everything by fax. Maybe it's different now, but back then they were still kind of stuck in Soviet times. So fax only, no emails. Um, have to make sure oftentimes their fax machines weren't working because they had bad uh, phone connections. And so I'd have to make sure that, uh, that they got the fax. And so I'd have to stay up all night. Uh, and eventually I got quotes from pretty much everybody that was interested in giving us a quote. And uh, uh, we submitted that uh, to the government. It took, took about two months to get that I worked on that contract. Um, How did the gun dealer, this infamous gun dealer, come into that play? Oh, the guy who Bradley Cooper yeah. plays? Mm -hmm. So uh, the guy who Bradley Cooper plays in the movie, his name, his real name is Henry Tomei. Uh, I think in the movie they call him Henry Gerard. Yeah, you know, legal reasons. <laughs> but his real name is Hen Henry Tomei. And uh, he's Swiss, actually. So he has a Swiss accent, unlike Bradley Cooper in the movie. But uh, <laughs> I, I thought Bradley did a good job playing him. It just wasn't. Yeah, he definitely accurate. did his own thing with that. Yeah, one. he did his own thing with the character. <laughs> the glasses. Yeah, yeah. It worked. Yeah, no, he did, a good, he did a good job. He's a great actor. Did he wear um, glasses? What? Did he have he the big glasses? He did not have glasses. He didn't look <laughs> anything like Bradley in the movie. He, in real life, he looked like a, like a slick Swiss banker. Hmm. Nice suit, very nice, you know, nice hair. I was very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> he was well put together. He was well put together. Very calm guy, never raised his voice. I feel like um, he got that done pretty well. Yeah, well, in, in the movie, he, he, the, he loses his shit, like, where he's like, what should we do with this Chinese ammo? He's like, do your fucking job. Yeah. Yeah, he never talked like that. He was it's like, not my problem. Yeah, exactly. Your problem. your problem. And right. did you meet him yeah. in the, obviously you didn't meet so, him in the casino? No, we didn't. So the way we actually met him was uh, Ephraim... Um, Eph so when Ephraim won his first contract, his first federal contract, he needed someone to finance it because he had no money. Uh, and so he asked his dad if his dad knew any potential financiers. And his dad introduced him to a guy named Ralph, who's in the movie as mm. a laundromat owner, uh, as a Jewish laundromat owner. In real life, he was not Jewish. He was Mormon. And he did not own a laundromat. He owned a machine gun factory. His name was Ralph. Really? Uh, yeah, his, yeah. His name was not Ralph Slutsky, which I thought was a funny name. <laughs> but uh, uh, his real name was Ralph Merrill. Um, I met him many times uh, over the years. He's a really nice guy. A very straight shooter, ironically. Um, and uh, Ralph Merrill owned a machine gun factory and had been doing business with Henry since like the 90s. And I think their, if I recall correctly, their first deal together was um, was to buy, I think it was some, I forgot the exact model, but it was maybe an Uzi, maybe something else, it was some sort of machine gun out of, um, uh, some automatic weapon out of South Africa that couldn't legally be imported unless they like chopped it into pieces and then I think left the receiver out so that because I think according to the ATF the receiver is the gun so if you don't have the receiver you could import the rest of the parts the rest are just spare parts so it, that it didn't fall under the uh, the um, uh, the rules that they couldn't export it from South Africa because it was an apartheid uh, source. So Henry set it up so that they, they chopped up all these guns in South Africa and got rid of the offending illegal part. And then they were able to ship everything to Ralph legally. And Ralph set up a factory and just manufactured that one part and was able to make a very large amount of money because he was able to buy those spare parts from South Africa for pennies on the dollar. And, um, and so that was their first deal together. And Henry has been around for like, uh, at that time was 20, now it's 40 years he's been around. At that time he was already been in business. He started out as a teenager too. Um, 
Uh, I don't know his exact story. I never, he never really liked to talk much. Uh, he was a very quiet guy. He was just all business, never went out for drinks, never did any of the socializing with anybody. Um, very much kept to himself and kept everything, you know, purely professional. So I don't know how he got started, but, uh, but I do know that he started around the same age as Ephraim was. Uh, and, um, Ephraim used to joke that, that Henry, um, Henry was nervous that Ephraim was going to take over the business because, you know, he sees himself, uh, you know, because, because just like, just like Henry started out at his age, but now Ephraim's even more aggressive. And so, you know, Henry, uh, Ephraim loved to joke about that, but, um, uh, Henry and Ephraim are like complete opposites in personality. E Ephraim was very loud and very, um, uh, flam, not flamboyant is the wrong word. Um, uh, very friendly, always making a joke, uh, um, very charming in a very superficial way. It can get, uh, get on people's good sides. That's he's able to talk people into things. He's very, very good at that. Um, and so you could talk people into things and then he, as soon as they turn their back, he stabs them in the back. You know, that's just kind of how he did things. So, um, but, uh, so Ralph introduced Ephraim to Henry in order to give him a, another source of, for his uh, government contracts. And so uh, um, uh, Ephraim started getting quotes from, from uh, Ralph, on a, uh, not from Ralph, from Henry on a regular basis whenever there would be items that uh, he thought Henry could supply. Henry particularly specialized in Eastern Europe, so he had really good connections in, uh, in all the former Soviet states, uh, particularly the Balkans. Um, he was very good friends with some of the politicians in Albania, which is how we got connected to the, um, to the ammo deal in Albania, uh, which eventually got us in trouble. So um, he was a vital part of that. Bit. Yeah, he was a vital part. So uh, uh, Ephraim got a quote from Henry uh, for, the, uh, for everything that Henry could supply, which wasn't everything. I mean, Henry got sources for most things, but he didn't have... He wasn't connected to everybody. And, um, and I got better prices than Henry for certain things. For like the grenades, I got way better prices than him. And that actually ended up being one of our biggest money makers were these grenades uh, that I got a source out of Bulgaria. Um, and uh, it, it was, it's, it's interesting because the stuff that got us in trouble, the AK-47 ammo, we were actually making the least amount of money on. Really? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you submit that bid. So we submit that bid. And um, I remember Ephraim was, uh, he wasn't sure uh, whether to go, because there's always the question of like, how much profit margin do you put on, on your bid, right? You have your sources, you have you th what you think is gonna cost you to, to do the logistics, to ship it from point A to point B. Um, and then you want to make money on it, so you need to add your profit margin. And the question is always how much, because obviously you want to make as much money as possible, but you, if you don't win the contract, you make zero. So you want to make, you want to put the maximum profit margin that you, you think you can actually win. And so he thought, well, everyone's going to be bidding this 10%. So we should bid at 9%, just in case everyone has the same source as we do. I mean, we don't know what sources other people have, so I'll bid at 9%. But then he started thinking, wait a second, but what if someone's thinking what I'm thinking? They bid at 9%, maybe I should bid at 8%, just in case, right? And so he's like, he's like, but there's no way anyone's gonna think that, so I shouldn't bid at 7%. I, think, I don't think anyone's gonna be thinking that far ahead. So I think it's either eight or 9%. He's like, should I do 8%, should I do 9%, 8%, 9%? He kept on going, he was completely indecisive. And this was like at the last day that, that the bid was due. And this was one of these bids, because a lot of, uh, um, this was going to the, the army, and um, depending on, on the size of the contract and which uh, federal agency you are submitting it to, it, it, they have different rules for like the format that they want it. Most federal agencies, I imagine, especially these days, are good with you just submitting everything electronically. And most of the stuff even back then, we were submitting electronically through email or through their online portal. Uh, but for this particular contract, maybe because it was so big, I don't know why, but they wanted everything in paper. Right. So we needed to print everything out. Uh, they did want some like Excel spreadsheets, but they wanted that on a CD ROM. Mm -hmm. Right. It wasn't enough to email it to them. They needed everything in physical media. <laughs> and so 
I told Ephraim, like, we only have like 45 minutes until the post office closed. We need to ship this to them in paper, physical format. Uh, and the printer is going to take some time to print. So you need to decide right now whether it's eight or eight percent or nine percent. He's like, eh, don't don't pressure me, don't pressure me. This is very important. This is very. I I got I got to go with my gut here. Right? He's and he's like pacing back and forth, pacing eight percent. He's like, what do I think that these guys? He, he knew his competitor. <laughs> what, what is General Dynamics going to think? Do you think? Are they going to? I know that they really want this contract, but are they really going to go so far as to go down to eight percent? I don't think they're going to go down to eight percent. You know, so like <laughs> he, he's like just like spitting in his mind. And I said, Ephraim, Ephraim, we're running out of time. We're going to get 0% if, if you don't make, make your mind up. He's like, fine, fine, fuck it. I can't leave money on the table, 9%. <laughs> <laughs> it ended up not mattering. It, it ended up matter. not mattering at all because eventually we found out that we it's actually true. We beat the next uh, the next lowest person by $52 million. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so after you submit this bid, how what's that waiting period like? after Because it, it came out to... Three hundred million dollars. Yeah, yeah, we was just under three hundred million our bid to the government, and um, uh, and that was the lowest by far. I think General Dynamics, uh, which is a multi-billion-dollar company, who was also bidding it, they bid it around like five hundred million dollars. Wow! Hmm. So almost double us. Um, there were some other smaller companies, such as ourselves, which were a bit more aggressive, and but they still bid it at like 350. So yeah, we beat the next person by by quite a lot, uh, and we only found that out. They weren't they're not actually allowed to tell you that. Uh, they're not allowed to tell you that because they don't want you to kind of adjust your bidding going forward to know like how how more competitive you are than your mm. uh, competitors uh, competitors. Um, so. Uh, they're not supposed to tell you, but I got really friendly with one of the contracting officers on the phone. So in the movie, they they're like we're in a meeting and they say, "Oh, we're not," and they uh, as that's if they would they would give you illegal information in front of all their colleagues. Right. I mean, that's never going to happen, <laughs> especially in the government where everyone's looking over everyone else's yeah. shoulder. No, it, the way it really happened was I was talking to one of the contracting officers on the phone, and he and we got friendly over the course of you know of because uh, this was a very big contract and, and uh, uh, very important to the army for us to deliver. So we got friendly and he eventually is like, yeah, you know, uh, uh, I know he was telling me, he's like, I, I know you guys are having some trouble getting the licensing and, and I understand that's a normal part of the business. And anyway, you guys were just so competitive. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're willing to give you a little bit more leeway. No worries. I'm like, really? We were really competitive? And he's like, oh yeah, you guys were, you guys really blew the competition out of the, out of the water. And I was like, really? How, how competitive? And he's like, okay, listen, we're talking on the phone. I'm really not allowed to tell you this, okay? But I'll tell you. <laughs> He's like, you beat the next guy by $52 million. And I was like, oh, my God. I told Ephraim, and he's like, fuck. He was so, so that was like the movie. He was fuck. so pissed off. Yeah, it just wasn't in the Pentagon. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah he was so pissed off. He, oh, was, he was really pissed off. Um, yeah. No matter how much money you're making, if you know that you could have made another 50 million. For sure. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, that was, uh, I mean, we were set if at the margins that we quoted and eventually negotiated, if we had delivered the entire contract without all the drama that eventually got it canceled, we probably would have made in the neighborhood of 60 million in profit. Wow. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, because we were running at an average of a 20% margin. Uh, wow. Which is a great yeah. margin for that size of Especially yeah. for a contract that size. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we had bid it at 9%. But then Ephraim went and renegotiated with all the suppliers mm. after the fact, and we found a few new suppliers, and uh, we found a few new uh, logistics uh, uh, methods that were that we managed to save money on. Some of them got us in trouble, like the repackaging yeah. to reduce the weight thing. So uh, how did yeah. you guys hear that you won the contract? Yeah, so we worked on. So the process of winning the contract was uh, we we in the summer of 2006 worked for about two months on it really hard like like all night um and then during the day uh, talking to the to the federal contractors getting various things explained so there was a, there was a huge amount of work for the first two months and then we submitted it and we didn't hear anything from them for like the rest of the year until like uh until like close to december time and um so like two three months and then the next thing we heard from them, they're like, uh, oh, we got to do all these audits on you. 
right? So there are like five different audits. There was a, a financial audit, a logistics audit, a, a sources audit, a past performance audit. They wanted to see, they wanted us to prove every aspect of these things. They, want to prove, uh, they wanted us to prove that we had the money to support the contract, that we had the logistics arranged, that we actually had sources to supply the contract, that we actually have done this before. So um, that was a whole, that took like another month and a half or so, um, during which we uh, did some various shady things in order <laughs> to pass those audits. Like uh, in, in the movie, uh, they mentioned one of them, uh, uh, the financial audit. Um, part of it was they wanted to see that we had a, uh, a uh, an accounting system uh, to handle the large volume of, of orders. And, QuickBooks. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. QuickBooks. <laughs> they wanted to see that we had QuickBooks. <laughs> and, but we did not. <laughs> we had nothing. Ephraim just did everything by the seat of his pants. He never did, he never, like, did his accounting. He, um, uh, he had no records of, mm. of anything. Um, pretty much we had to hire a forensic accountant to go and, like, create like the last like uh, two years of accounting records to kind of to like back uh, backtrack everything, uh, and he pretty much created everything from scratch. It took him like a good like few weeks to do that, hmm. and so yeah, uh, just to make it look like we're a responsible company that does our accounting and and takes uh, track of all keeps track of all our financial issues. Um, there was, I thought that was a that you know I mean that's like slightly shady, but the even worse was they wanted to see um, uh, significant past performance, which we did have, but of course nothing was ever, Ephraim was uh, never shy about going overboard. So he created, uh, there was one deal he was gonna do with, with Ralph's company um, uh, for, for like I think 20 million rounds of AK-47 ammo and then the deal for whatever reason it fell through so it never actually happened so but they already had already applied for some of the licenses for the import licenses to do this deal and had been it had been granted so he used the import licenses that were granted as proof that they had done this deal and he got a letter from Ralph saying that they had done this deal which they did not do but Ralph was willing to bend a few uh, uh, a few facts in order to win this three hundred million dollar contract um, which is why he got in trouble later on but um, uh, so yeah so that was so that was like the whole process and they also sent down a team of people down to our office to inspect our office it was a bunch of like uh, middle-aged like older ladies they were all ladies for some reason I don't know why but they they sent them they were very nice very sweet and we we were so nervous <laughs> because we're like oh my god the government's coming into the office they're gonna see that we're just a bunch of schmucks you know <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so we we like quickly like like bought a bunch of like uh, furniture that made it look more professional because like Ephraim was really? super che- Ephraim was super cheap he didn't want to spend any money so like he bought everything crap happy because he he didn't want to like he didn't want to like uh buy a nice desk or nice filing cabinet so Mm. but then he was like oh crap the the government's gonna see we gotta look good um so he quickly like you know bought new desks bought a new filing cabinet so it would look nice and uh hired a maid to clean up the office because it was a mess (laughs) um you know hired like some new people so that would look like we so we had a uh like a a front desk person (laughs) did you guys have any employees at the time um, not, not at this time. Um, oh, oh, by the time we, they came down to our office, we did because by the time we, they were doing the audits, we realized they, that we needed to look legit. So Ephraim rented a nice office okay. and then we started hiring people because he realized that you can't have a big office with nobody in it. And he wanted to do a few other things. He wanted to like um, uh, go after a whole bunch of other contracts. And so mm-hmm. he decided to, that this was a good time to expand the business. So th- this was the time when we started hiring people. Got it. And, um, and so, yeah, so the government uh, uh, inspectors came down. They were actually very, very nice. Um, apparently it worked, whatever it was that we did because they gave us a great report. They said, you know, glowing report. And um, and uh, they awarded us the contract. And so the way I found out about the contract award was um, 
I, I got a call from, I was, I was at home, I got a call from Ephraim, and he goes to me, he's like, hey, uh, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. And I said, well, uh, what's the bad news? And he said, well, our first task order is only 600K. And I said, we won the fucking contract. And he's like, yeah, motherfucker, we won the fucking contract. Wow. He's like, he's like, I'm coming to pick you up. We're going to celebrate. And, uh, and so for people who don't know, the way the, way the government works is um, when they give you a very large contract, usually what they do is they split it into smaller pieces called task orders, right? So the total value of the contract was $300 million, but they didn't just give us an order for $300 million. They were going to give us pieces of it. Now, when we read the, the, um, the solicitation, um, it was very clear that the government was only legally required to give us the first task order. And they were allowed to legally cancel the contract at any point after that first task order. So we were nervous. We were like, hey, you know, we're bidding on this contract with the assumption that we're going to get the entire thing. Uh, and this is going to make a very big difference, especially for logistics costs, whether you're hiring one plane or 200 planes uh, is going to make a very big difference in how much that aircraft is going to cost to hire. So uh, we just went under the assumption that they're going to give us the entire contract. But we knew that if they don't give us the entire contract, we'd be screwed, right? Because there was no way we we're going to deliver the first task order if we didn't have uh, uh, the rest of it. So when we saw there was a $600,000 first task order, we're like, well, that's not even enough to like fill an aircraft load. So unless they give us a second task order, we're kind of fucked. And what was that first task order for? It was for uh, 762 by 54 ammo, which was machine gun ammo. And so, yeah, it was, it was uh, and, and I think for like a small amount of grenades. And, and so it was like two different items. They were coming from different countries and it was like not going to, we were not going to, we were not going to be able to deliver that unless they a, give us a, a follow-up task order. Was, was it more of a test to see if you guys are so, capable? So that's what we thought. At first we thought it was going to be, oh, they're just testing us. But then they gave us the second task order like two weeks later before we had even delivered anything. So I think what it really was, was they just put it out there because that was the money that they had uh, like um, already in like awarded, like given to them by, by the army or by Congress. So they were legally allowed to use this money. I think it was like, uh, like 600 K or, you know, something like that, um, that they were, that they had already uh, assigned or, um, that, that they had already um, distributed to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're not allowed to give task orders unless they already have the money assigned to this contract. So um, they weren't able to give us anything bigger, but then I guess it just took a couple of weeks for the money to, for the rest of the money to come in. And they, and then the next task order was like $50 million. Wow. <laughs> so okay. we're like, okay, whew, <laughs> we've, we're good. We're nice. good on this, on the quantity bit. Yeah. And yeah, and so yeah, Ephraim picks me up, and he, we go to this uh, Italian restaurant, and of course he's like he had this like little plastic bullet filled with cocaine, and so he's like pretending to blow his nose on like the the, the napkin, and he's like you know snorting cocaine under it, and he's like and he like he's like passing it to me, he's like he's like you're fucking doing some coke here, you fucking do it, just fucking do it. <laughs> he's like we're celebrating, we're doing it, we're drinking champagne, we're snorting snorting cocaine, you're fucking doing. I'm like okay, fine. You know, I wasn't like really into so you did it. it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I, I was just like, just to shut him up, you know, because like, I, I, I've never been, I've done, I've done cocaine, but like, I've never been a fan. I don't like things going up my nose. Uh, I personally, I prefer a good coffee. I think it does <laughs> a better job of, of wiring me and getting me to work and it lasts longer and it's healthier for you and it tastes better and it doesn't, it's not crap up your nose that gives you this nasty drip in the back of your yeah. throat. It's, it's yeah. gross. I, I really don't understand why people love cocaine, but you know, it's people's brains react differently to different substances. So he loved cocaine. I mean, he was fucking doing it all day. So, uh, yeah. So he's like, and he started, you know, we, we got champagne and he's like, he's like, let me tell you something, David, 
Those fat cats in their boardrooms and general dynamics, they don't know what's about to hit them. They're worried about their stock price for the quarter. We're going to own these motherfuckers. We're going to be flying around in private jets, and we're going to be owning these. These guys, we're going to take over this industry. And I'm like, well, Ephraim, let's just concentrate on delivering this contract. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 no. He's like, we're going for everything now. This is, we're, we're rolling now. We're rolling. So he's like, I'm hiring more people. We're going to bid on more contracts. I'm like, Ephraim, let's just concentrate on this contract. I'm like, no. He's like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? He's like, he's like you know what? He's like, I trust you, David. He's like, why don't you uh, handle this contract? I think, I think you've got, you got the experience. You can handle this. I'm going to go for new contracts. I'm like, Ephraim, I think maybe we should do this together. He's like, no, no, no. You got this. You got this. Um, so I'm like, okay, look. I mean, if that's, you're insisting I got this, okay. I mean, I'm, I'll do it, right, obviously. Um, and so I started working on it. So... In the arms business, um, one of the big challenges is transportation, right? Because, um, I mean, in any contract, you need to transport things, but particularly when you're talking about military equipment and um, uh, stuff that's under the ITAR classification, which is uh, all the stuff that's, um, uh, that's regulated as far as military equipment, um, you need, legally, you need permission from every country that you that your goods either pass through uh, like ground wise or even fly over right now originally we wanted to ship it all by ocean to like Pakistan and then truck it into Afghanistan because that would have been by far the cheapest way to to uh, deliver but then everyone told us that's just a recipe for getting all your <laughs> shit stolen because say. yeah because Pakistan and Afghanistan um, a large parts of it are run by warlords who would love to have a shipment of a massive shipment of ammo come through their territory that they can grab. And uh, there's nothing you could do about that because they're a warlord of their territory and there's no one who can tell them it, the, the rule of law is very, very shaky in that area of the world. So we realized that it was way too risky to do that. Uh, we also tried to go uh, to do it by train through Russia uh, to come in from the north, but uh, but the Russians were not happy with us or with the United States at the time because um, the United States put the Russians on a blacklist. Um, in fact, this is the reason we why we got the contract in the first place uh, was originally the the army was going to buy everything directly from the Russians because the Russians had everything. Um, they didn't need to like go to a bunch of different suppliers, but then the Russians sold the Iranians some nuclear technology and got uh, themselves landed on the blacklist, and so it was became illegal for uh, the United States to buy or sell uh, military equipment from Russia, and then they couldn't buy from the Russians. So then they had realized they needed to buy the only other uh, sources of this supply because this this is all former War Warsaw Pact ammo. Uh, this is not stuff for your M16 or your NATO standard weapon systems that the West uses and the West manufactures. The Afghans and the Iraqis, they're used to uh, using Warsaw Pact weapons like the AK-47. Um, and uh, added bonus, it's way cheaper as well. And the army wanted to spend as little money as possible uh, to arm our new allies. So they figured it's much cheaper to buy Warsaw Pact weapons. It's also what the Afghans and Iraqis are used to using. Um, and the, the Warsaw Pact weapons are designed for soldiers who have a much lower level of training. So you don't need to clean it nearly as often for it to work. AK-47s are famously rugged. You could like bury it in the ground for 10 years and it'll still fire afterwards. So unlike an M16, an M16 is like a Ferrari. You have to, it works very well, but you have to take very, very good care of it. Uh, AK-47 is like a Corolla. <laughs> you know, it, it'll get you from point A to point B. It'll, it'll fire, but it won't be the most accurate, but it'll work forever. So, um, so the... Uh, the Afghans and the Iraqis, um, in general, have much lower levels of of, um, of training, and so it was better for them to use these weapon systems, anyways. So, but of course, the the West doesn't have factories to manufacture these uh, these types of weapons or, or or munitions, at least not in the quantities that they needed. So they realized that the only other source besides Russia, which they couldn't buy from, were all these little former Soviet 
uh, Union Warsaw Pact countries in Eastern Europe, such as Ukraine and Albania and, and um, uh, the Czech Republic and all the, those countries. But not a single one of those countries has all the ammo, all the munitions necessary. So they're going to have to deal with a whole bunch of different suppliers. And they didn't want to do that. And so they said, instead of dealing with like 50 different suppliers, we're just going to put it out there for middlemen to give us a package deal. And that's where we came in. Uh, they, they wanted to deal with one point of contact, and we gave them that. We uh, brought all the suppliers together under one roof, so to speak. So wow. the Russians, when this happened, uh, they realized that they're going to lose out on these hundreds of millions of dollars that they were expecting to uh, get in business from from the army and they were really pissed off about it and they uh, the federal government anna- always has the award announcements right so they so you know who won- wins the contract so the Russians looked it up and they saw that we won the contract that they were supposed to have and so they didn't like us and so every time that we tried to do anything in any area they controlled they tried to block us. So we tried to get like a license to move the stuff by train through Russia. And they were like, forget it. You know, we're not giving you that. Uh, And so we weren't able to move it by train. So we realized that our only option was to fly it in because Afghanistan's a landlocked country. It's surrounded by Russia and Pakistan. And neither of those were good options to get in. And, uh, so, but every country you fly over needs to give you what they call flyover permission. So, uh, in order to fly your military goods through their airspace. And so we had to get, I, th- I forgot the exact number. I think it was like, like 12 or 13 different countries that we were flying from Albania to, uh, to Afghanistan. And we had to get permission from each country. And a lot of those countries are former Soviet Union countries, and they aren't uh, the most efficient with answering the phone, um, as I learned when getting quotes from a lot of them. And uh, But eventually, I got flyover permission from everybody, except for Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan refused to give us flyover permission. And the way I did it was... Um, Usually, the, the what would happen is the, the the logistics company would try to get the flyover permission, right? And it's just like a matter of course, you know. They get they request these things all the time, but because military goods have a political dimension, sometimes they get denied, and then the logistics company comes back to to you, and they're like, hey. Um, for whatever reason, this, this, and this country aren't giving us uh, flyover permission. Is there anything you could do on your end to get the flyover permission? So what I did was I would call up the U.S. Embassy in that country, and I would ask to speak to the military attaché. The military attaché is the official um, person, uh, the representative of the Pentagon within the, the embassy, which is run by the State Department different departments in the federal government, right? Uh, So the military attache is in charge of uh, military matters within uh, that country. So um, I would ask to speak to the military attache. I'd get through to the military attache and I'd say, hey, we're a uh, federal contractor. We have this contract. I'd give him a copy of the contract so he knows I wasn't bullshit. I wasn't bullshitting him. And... um, and I said, we're trying to get flyover permission you know, to support uh, the U.S. Army in Afghanistan, and uh, but your country has not given it to us, so can you check in to see what's going on? And this happened, uh, like, I think three or four times. Uh, they went in, the, the military administration would say, yeah, sure, let me look into this. They'd make a few phone calls, and then the, uh, the uh, flyover permission would usually be granted. I don't know what he said to them, how he leaned on them, whether it was a a carrot or a stick he used. I don't know. Right. But he but they would get it done. But with Uzbekistan, the military attache is like, look, I've been calling these guys all day. They're just like not returning my phone calls. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why they're not giving you the flyover permission. Um, And uh, and and so I realized Uzbekistan has a national airline, and um, and I got a quote from them to move the cargo. And as soon as we said, okay, we'll use your quote, and they were actually pretty competitive. 
as soon as we said, okay, we'll use your quote, they got us the flyover permission. <laughs> mm, nice. Funny how that so, works. Yeah, exactly. As soon as there's money on the line for them. Yeah. Interesting. They, yeah, they got it. Interesting. Yeah. So I started working on it and, uh, of course, ran into the whole issue with the flyover permits. And, and, uh, and at the time, uh, at the time uh, there was a huge spike in oil prices. This is early 2007. And, of course, all of our shipping was quoted. Uh, it, was, uh, it was aircraft, right? And aircraft is super sensitive to oil prices because the most – the vast majority of the cost of the aircraft is the fuel, mm -hmm. right? And when fuel shoots up, your air logistics costs shoot up. So there's a huge spike in oil prices, and suddenly we were screwed. We couldn't deliver anything without losing money. And, um, and of course, now what a professional company would have done, like General Dynamics, right? They would have uh, done a, uh, like an oil hedge, right? So you think you're going to have a uh, you're going to be spending 20 30 million dollars on aircraft costs so you buy a little bit of insurance that uh that if oil goes up your your the insurance pays out so it, it uh it takes care of the uh the uh volatility in the oil market as far as your fuel costs go this is what a professional company would do Ephraim didn't, didn't roll like that so he didn't want to spend money on it. he knew about it right he knew he maybe should do it but he didn't want to spend the money on the uh on the insurance so just very high risk tolerance obviously so uh when oil prices did spike we were kind of screwed and we we're like oh, we can't we can't deliver what are we going to do and so that's when I, I you know we started thinking of a, we could deliver the grenades right because the grenades were were much higher margins the aircraft anti-aircraft rockets were much higher margins but the vast majority of the of the um of the of the stuff as far as shipment goes was the lower value stuff the ak-47 ammo the uh the pk ammo, ammo the 762 by 54 ammo so uh, we and we and this was the stuff that that the army was yelling at us to deliver because it was getting into springtime. This was like around February, March time. We'd won the contract end of January, and we started working on it. And then by the time like March rolled around, the army was telling us, "Hey guys, fighting season's coming up in Af in Afghanistan because they only fight." They can't fight during the winter in Afghanistan because there's very high mountains and a lot of snow. So they have fighting season, right? And uh, the snow was melting and fighting season was starting and our Afghan allies were running out of ammo. And the army was telling us, guys, our allies need the ammo. They're going to be in a real bad situation soon unless you guys deliver soon. So they were really ramping up the pressure on us to deliver. And... Um, but all the stuff that they particularly needed, like the like the uh, the AK-47, the machine gun ammo, was uh, was the the stuff that was most expensive to ship. It was the lowest value, lowest margin stuff. And we were scrambling. We were trying to arrange various uh, alternative. Um, and this was when we were looking into um, into uh, doing stuff by rail and by ocean and and. Uh, we were trying to figure out some alternative way and then we realized that there was no way we can that that was safe to do we realized we had to do it by air and and then i realized i told Ephraim, like hey you know all this ammo is packaged in these in these wooden crates and the wooden crates they look they look pretty hefty right so if we remove the wooden crates it's still in like the metal tins Right, so it's still vacuum sealed. If we remove the the metal tins, get rid of the wooden crates, we'll save a whole bunch of weight. And he's like, "That's a very good point. We can do that. We'll save a whole bunch of money uh, on the shipping." But we didn't really trust the Albanians um, to give us accurate information because uh, they were kind of like flaky and language issues. And and so we're like, "We we need to test this stuff out ourselves." So um, we sent out. Um, I was dealing with the government uh, uh primarily and um and with a bunch of other suppliers for the grenades and the rockets and everything else so um Ephraim thought it, that i should stay in the u.s so i could be the point contact with the government uh contracting officer and so we sent a, a friend of mine uh, alex to albania to do the inspection um and he the fact the second he walked in he saw 
the Chinese lettering on the boxes. And he's like, and he, he was, um, uh, he had studied international relations in college. So he knew about, about uh, the uh, arms embargo against China and all that. And so he's like, hey, you guys know that there's these Chinese lettering on the boxes. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's Albanian. <laughs> He's like, no, no, there's Chinese lettering all over these boxes. And so we're like, oh, fuck, because her contract specifically said no Chinese ammo can be delivered, either directly or indirectly. That's That was the terms in the contract. And they didn't mention the embargo in the contract at all. So it wasn't no ammo that could that violates the embargo could be delivered under this contract. It was no Chinese ammo, period, right? Because in for people who don't know the uh, the history in 1989 there was um uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre occurred in China where a bunch of um uh Chinese uh, university students were protesting for um democracy and the Chinese government pretty much killed a lot of them uh to crush the the um the movement and and this was all done on like live TV and so it created this huge scandal and because of that the um the United States placed uh, China on, on a military arms embargo. So it's illegal for U.S. companies and citizens to buy or sell military equipment, ITAR classification um, uh, items to the Chinese. And um, so that's why they put in our contract, no Chinese ammo can be delivered directly or indirectly. However, the ammo that was in Albania didn't actually violate the embargo because it had been given to the Albanians in the 70s before 1989 right so it was given to them while it was still legal so technically that ammo is legal i mean if you buy a chinese ak-47 in 1988 and you bring it into the united states even in 1990 or now you can still buy and sell that gun i mean it's it's a legal gun because it was bought legally so uh so the ammo in albania was legal as far as the the uh, embargo was concerned but as far as our contract was concerned it's it w violated the terms of our contract so we thought well either we can uh you know tell the army and say hey guys we know you need this ammo um but we just discovered that it has was originally from china which violates the terms of our contract doesn't violate the embargo so can you give us a waiver um you sign this letter that says that we can uh, uh deliver the ammo and they could have said yeah that makes sense our allies really need the ammo just deliver it doesn't violate the terms of the um, of the embargo we really should have put that in the contract mentioning the embargo uh that was sloppy writing on our part they could have said that right and they probably would have if i had to guess but they because they really needed the ammo so that that's what i w guess they would have done but we also thought well, you know, they could also say something along the lines of, well, you know, all your competitors bid on this contract with that clause in the solicitation. So it's not fair that you guys get to deliver something that violates the clause that your competitors had to bid under. And so therefore, in the interest of fair competition, we're going to take that contract away from you and put it out for open bid. And now you could bid on it again with the, you know, and everyone else can bid on it. And we're like, uh, maybe lose a $300 million contract. Maybe we shouldn't tell them. <laughs> and, uh, so we decided not to tell them. And, uh, and just so we wouldn't set off alarm bells, we decided to repackage the ammunition. Um, and we were planning on repackaging it anyway, just to save on the weight. But because of the Chinese Chinese issue, we decided that it, taking it out of the wooden crates wasn't enough because the metal tins also had Chinese markings. And there was also uh, papers inside the tins that had Chinese documentation about like the year and location it was, it was manufactured in. So we realized the only way we're going to keep this from being discovered is if we completely repackage the ammo out of the out of the tin so we hired an albanian um uh, we found a guy who who manufactures box uh, cardboard boxes in albania and because we needed to buy a whole bunch of cardboard boxes we wanted to make the packaging as light as possible to save us as much money as possible so we hired this guy and he used his workers to do the repackaging operation. And we put it sealed it into plastic to prevent from corrosion. Then we sealed it in the in these thick corrugated um, cardboard boxes. Uh, so it was actually a, the packaging was decent. It wasn't like um, uh, 
uh, a low quality or anything packaging not the same level as a vacuum sealed tin but uh but we asked the army whether we could do this packaging situation now we told them it was so we could inspect the ammo to make sure it's not corroded and that it's good quality we didn't tell them the real reasons um but they said, yeah, that, that's fine. That, that packaging configuration is acceptable. And so we got it in writing. Very important, guys. Get everything in writing from the government, right? So just one of the few tips you're, you're going to learn at War Dogs Academy. <laughs> that's right. Go. Exactly. Um, and uh, and they, they confirmed in writing that that packaging configuration was acceptable. And so we started delivering to them. And the receiving officer in uh, Kabul was thrilled. I mean, the, he called me up and he's like, thank you guys. You have no idea what a big difference this is making to our allies. You're really saving lives here. That's, that was what he told me. I was like, oh, that, that makes me feel so good. You know, <laughs> and, <laughs> saving lives. As I'm getting rich. Yeah, ex- <laughs> what? As you get rich. Yeah, that's a little side. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, real yeah. quick, how much money did you save by repackaging it into a lighter? So we, we saved uh, just the AK-47 ammo about $3 million worth wow. of, worth of, uh, um, of logistics costs. Was that for the base of the whole contract or... Just what um, you delivered up to that point. No, so we we it, we calculated if we deliver everything, we were going to save three million dollars, which is next to three million dollars in profit. Remember, this is the least profitable yeah. component of the yeah. contract, but the repackaging, the entire operation, cost us a hundred grand. Mm-hmm. So to wow. save three yeah. million dollars, to save three. So million that's accurate. Dollars. Yes, okay. it's it's yeah. accurate. Yeah, they. It's interesting. The movie is like really accurate in some spots and like really inaccurate in other spots. And they uh, they had me as a consultant on the movie, and so I gave them as much accurate information as I could. But they were very clear that I had zero power to change any aspect of the movie, and so that they were going to change it however they wanted. And I better be happy with it because there's nothing I could do about it. Yeah. So we'll do it another podcast movie versus reality yes exactly yeah um so uh yeah i mean they're they're very accurate in some aspects of it but uh but yeah so we we hired the um uh the guy to do the repackaging everything went great until of course ephraim got greedy and he wanted to try to cut henry out of the deal uh because he found out um, through the box guy, actually, he found out um, that that Henry was buying the ammo at half the price that he was selling it to us. Uh, he was buying it for two cents a round from the Albanian uh, Ministry of Defense and selling it to us at four cents a round. We were selling it to the government at ten and a half cents a round, but we had to spend five cents a round in shipping. So we were making, and this is after the repackaging. So we were making like a good twenty percent on that, um, like a nine and a half to eleven to ten and a half somewhere. Oh, uh, my, my my math is terrible off in off the top of my head, but but we were making between ten and twenty percent on that ammo. We were making higher margins on the grenades and on the um, on the um, rockets, um, but. Um, uh, so yeah, so he tried to, he realized that, he found out that, that Henry was buying it for half the price. Uh, and he was like, well, let's just buy from the Ministry of Defense directly. And he actually, Ephraim flew over to Albania to try to negotiate with them. And before he flies over, he goes to me, he's like, listen, I need, a, I need a, to give them a reason for us to give us a, a better price. Right. As he loved to say, a negotiation is a contest between people of who can come up with a better reason for things to go their way. Right. So this is why he's such a good negotiator. So he's like, I need to give them a reason to give us a better price. So I need you to get all the quotes that you got from our other potential suppliers and doctor it to make it look like the prices are lower. So I could say, hey, guys, if you don't give me a better price, I'm going to go to my to my other to the other your competitors, uh, the other suppliers and get it from them. And so I, I did it. I um, used PDF editing software. It wasn't too hard <laughs> uh, to change the numbers. Print it out for him. He gets to the to Albania. He talks to the the contact guy, the Albanian guy. He's like, he's like, look, I've got all these other quotes. The guy takes one look. He's like, this is all fake. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. He didn't even look at it. He didn't wow. even look at it. He's like, don't show me your fake documents. Yeah. He. I thought I did so a pretty he knew good the game. I knew. I thought I did a pretty good job doctoring it. You know, I don't think you were able to tell, um, but he knew the game. He knew what he was trying to do, and he wasn't even listening to him. And so 
but uh, uh, yeah, so the guy he was talking to, a guy named Yili Panari, who was the head of uh, MAKO, um, which was the government-owned organization that does all the export uh, stuff for Albania, um, he was not apparently not the the final decision maker. So uh, Yili um, eventually uh, agreed to take Ephraim to meet his boss, uh, who, who turned out to be nobody who had any official position in the government, a guy named Deliorgi, right? And this guy, he takes him to meet him, goes to this like construction site, this like big high rise construction site, takes him into this construction. They go up like some stairs and he opens a door and suddenly it, it, the rest of the building is all under construction. Suddenly it's this like beautiful like boardroom, like in the middle of like this construction site, like apparently they're like, I guess trying to hide this thing. Uh, to keep it uh, off the radar beautiful boardroom there's this a few real tough looking guys in the in the boardroom and the guy yeah, and the second Ephraim walks in he knows that he can't run his mouth like he usually does right I mean usually he'd be like talking loudly you know getting getting angry getting the whole like trying to like manipulate people but he, he took one look at these guys and he's like and he got really quiet and he knows you can't like fuck with these guys and they look they they say to him they're like oh, so you know we we, we 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 know that you want a better price but um, we can do a better price but uh, we know that you're repackaging the ammo and you're paying this guy a bunch of money, so why don't you give us that repackaging contract, and then we give you a better price. And, and Ephraim's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Fuck that guy. He's fired, you're hired, let's do this, right? They gave him a slightly better price, not that much, slightly better price, took the contract away from the box guy, and uh, the box guy calls me up, and he's like, hey, listen, I know you guys are switching suppliers for this and i understand it's business uh you know no hard feelings but i did get you guys wanted me to do this job so i still have like about twenty thousand dollars worth of boxes you guys are going to need this anyway so why don't you just buy the boxes for me and i said yeah that makes sense uh let me get ephraim to uh to send you the payment and so i tell ephraim and he's like yeah yeah sure that makes sense i'll do it i'll do it no problem and then he just never does it and the guy calls me up again, and he's like, hey, uh, you guys going to buy the boxes? And I'm like, oh, he didn't do that? Well, let me let me get on his case. I get him. I'm like, Ephraim, just buy the fucking boxes from this guy. You know, like, don't leave him hanging out in the cold. He's like, he's like, well, you know, the, uh, you know the, our new suppliers say that they've got it all covered, so they don't need it. So, so fuck that guy. And I'm like, Ephraim, he kind of knows everything. You know, he knows the repackaging out you probably should just pay him the 20 grand it's 20 grand right we've got a 300 million dollar contract here and he's like ah eh, he's not gonna do anything fuck him unfortunately he was wrong about that uh that guy got really pissed and he called up the uh the new york times and he told them what we were doing and wow. he called up the fbi and told them what we were doing Ooh. and uh i only found out later of course that he did this but um and his biggest mistake is he called up the Albanian local press and told them that that the Albanian politicians were getting kickbacks from our contract, which was probably true because the, probably some of that doubling of the money that, that Henry was getting was going towards kickbacks uh, because there's a reason he was able to land this deal for us. He was very friendly with the, with the Albanian government uh, people. Um, he was very friend apparently he was very friendly in particular with uh the Al the Albanian prime minister's son who eventually sued me for uh uh and he also sued the writer of the war dogs book Guy Lawson and and um and a few other and sued Ephraim and and a bunch of people for defamation uh, he ended up losing that lawsuit so i can say that uh uh that uh he that Henry and this guy were were good friends uh or at least you know friendly enough and he was able to land this deal. So I assume that there were kickbacks being paid. Obviously, Henry didn't tell us about it, um, and we didn't ask. We didn't, we didn't want to know because it's it for you should know that it's illegal to pay uh, people bribes, even if they're foreign government officials. It's against U.S. law. So you can go to prison in the United States for paying a bribe to someone in a different country. Um, so, or even being involved in it, like you, you know, like the business you're doing is going towards bribes in another country that's illegal for you to do. So, um, we very much did not want to know about it. 
and he never volunteered any information. So, uh, so we didn't know whether it was true or whether it wasn't, but, uh, but Ephraim, needless, needless to say, Ephraim was not able to, uh, cut Henry out of the deal. And, uh, he was forced to make this, uh, deal, you know, with, by getting rid of the box guy. And, uh, because the box guy got really pissed and he told the Albanian press, about uh, about the potential kickbacks, or he sounded like he was very confident that there were kickbacks happening. I don't know how he knew or if he just assumed. Uh, about a few weeks later, the box guy's name was Costa. Uh, he, he ended up dead. And yeah, wow. Yeah, he uh, under very mysterious circumstances. He was driving in his car on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere in a field. And apparently his car got into some sort of accident and he was thrown from his car like 30 feet and they found him face down dead, like near his car. There were no other cars there. There was no uh, other people there. They don't know how this particular accident happened. Uh, but yeah, but he ended up dead. Wow. So yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, so it wasn't, so in the movie, it was, uh, it was the box, uh, it was the, the driver who gets killed. There was no driver there. Uh, we just took taxis. Mm. Yeah. We, we didn't have like a set driver. Um, uh, but uh, there in real life, it was the box guy who got mm. killed. Wow. So yeah. he doesn't pay the box yeah. guy. Yeah. The box guy calls the FBI, the New York yeah. Times. Yeah. How does it all? How does it all come all down? Out? Right. So um, a few months. So around this time, around this time, um, Shortly after Ephraim screwed over Costa, uh, I guess he was in screwing over mode because he came into my office and he tells me, he's like, hey, you know, um, a lot of the guys around the office are telling me that uh, you're not pulling your weight around here. And I'm like, what are you, ta what are you talking about, the guys around the office? I'm like, what, 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 are, what are they saying that I'm not doing? He's like, well, you know, um, we've got all these other like contracts, like the contract to Iraq that we were having some trouble and you're not helping out with that. And I said, but we have like a commission basis. Do you want to give me a commission on that uh, Iraq contract? I'll help out with it. He's like, oh, don't be ridiculous. I mean, you didn't help win that contract. So why should you get a commission on it? I'm like, then why should I help deliver it? He's like, well, because, you know, if we fail on that contract, then then we could lose our license to uh, sell to the government and, uh, you know, we get canceled for cause. And, uh, and then the Afghan contract goes down too. So you got to help with everything to help the company grow. And I said, well, then you want to give me a piece of the company? Because if you're, I'm working on everything, I should get a piece of everything. He's like, he's like, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't do this for anyone else, but you're like my best friend. So I'll make you a, a very, very, I think more than reasonable offer. I'll give you, I, have, I own 100% of AEY Inc. I would never give it to anyone except for you. But I will give you, I'll make you, you know, I'll give you 100K a year salary and you get 1% of AEY. I'm like, 1% of AEY. But the Afghan contract is going to make us 90% of the profits for the next two years at least, right? So I think I'll stay with my 25% of the Afghan contract <laughs> instead of 1% of the whole company. And... And, uh, and he goes to me, he's like, well, you know, that's my offer. Take it or leave it. And I'm like, what? So you're not going to pay me what we agreed upon? And he's like, yeah, that's, it's not fair. You know, it's not fair. You, should, you need to take the 1% or, or that's it or nothing. And I said, well, I'll see you in court, motherfucker. And so I walked out the door. I didn't slam his window or anything like that. I didn't punch him in the face either as much as I would have <laughs> loved to. I, I, I was this close to punching him in the face. I was really close. So, because until this point, I've been work, I hadn't been paid anything. And he just kept rolling my Not money. Not a dime. Not a dime. I, I kept, he kept on rolling my money into, into the financing the deal. And um, I was living off my savings. And I was running low on cash. And, uh, so I needed to make, and so like, I was starting to feel the pressure and, uh, and then he's like, well, I'm not giving you anything. And I'm like, fuck, what am I going to do? Cause my daughter had just been born like a few months prior to that. So I've got a kid to support. Um, 
and now I have no money and no way to make it. And so I was like, like my whole life, like I thought I was going to be a millionaire and now I'm broke. Ugh. And so the, the, uh, the difference was just soul crushing. I've never been so depressed in my life. I've been, I went through like a good, uh, my friends told me like that the two weeks after that was like one of the hardest parts of my life because I was like really running low on money and, and with no, with nothing coming with no end in sight, nothing coming in. And, um, yeah, it was it was a really really hard time, uh, and then I realized, well, you know, well, so I contacted a lawyer to get to sue him, and my lawyer said, yeah, of course we're going to sue him. You've got a, a decent case, but uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find the contract that we had signed. That part is true so you in did the sign movie. A contract. We did it. We had a written a handwritten contract. It really, I blame myself for this. Uh, we had a, a handwritten agreement that I that I had on my kitchen, my dining room table. And I tried to scan it to like email it to myself. So I, so I wouldn't lose it, but my scanner was broken. Oh. And so I was planning on getting the scanner fixed and it was on like a stack of papers. And by the time I got the scanner fixed, I just couldn't find the, the contract anymore. I was like, where did it go? And the only person who was coming in out of my apartment was Ephraim. So, and the only person who had any reason to take that piece of paper was him. So I assume he took it. Um, but my, the contract mysteriously disappeared. Uh, but my lawyer told me, you know, you, got, you obviously did a whole bunch of work on this contract. And everyone knows that you're not working for free. So there was an agreement. And believe it or not, an oral agreement is enforceable in, uh, by law. So uh, now the question is, what was that agreement? And so we were getting ready to sue him and uh, about a month and a half. And just to clarify, mm -hmm. what was your portion of that again? So I was supposed to get 25% of the profits. And which was how much money? So if we had delivered the entire thing at the rate that we were going at, we would have made a total of $60 million and I would have gotten 25%, so around $15 million. So, yeah, I was really counting on that $15 yeah. million. Yeah, sure. And uh, in my mind, I already made the money. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and how I was long? already picking out my, the nicest car I could of think of, you know. So, what was yeah. the period of performance for that contract? It was two years. Okay. It was so over two years. So you're going to make period. the $15 million in two years? In, within two years, yeah. And we were getting paid as the money was rolling, yeah, sure. but we were rolling the money back into, into financing the contract. So we could have pulled out money, but we were just kept on using it to finance the contract. Do you know if he was pulling out money? I don't think he was uh, because he didn't really <laughs> – surprisingly he at the time anyway he had a, uh, he did not have an expensive lifestyle he actually was very cheap like very cheap like like stupidly cheap like uh one of my favorite uh, memories of his cheapness was uh was this was early on when i first started working with him i remember him getting on the phone with at&t and spending like a good 45 minutes like yelling and screaming and asking to speak to their manager because he felt that he was overcharged on his phone bill about five bucks. And I told him, I'm like, Ephraim, what are, you, what, are you, what are you doing? Why are you spending so much time trying to get this $5 uh, overage charge that you don't believe you should have been charged? You should just work on a contract and you make way more money. And he's like, it's the principle of the matter. Nobody fucks me. <laughs> <laughs> he only fucks other people. Yeah, yeah. 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 he's the one yes. who fucks. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, he was like pathological in, mm -hmm. like, in like not spending money. Um, even going to a nice restaurant was like a, like a rare ish occasion. Mm -hmm. He, at the time he had started dating a girl. Um, Oof, uh, yeah. Oh dude. It was the most, it was the most, um, so you also, also a pathological cheater. Yes, but it was, I would say that wasn't even the problem. Uh, it was just the, the, they had a very toxic relate, like as talk, like 
like a uh, classical toxic relationship, constantly yelling and screaming at each other, you know, lots of crying and making up afterwards in front of everybody, oh, you know, God. like in, like in front of like friends, of like course. in public. Right. It's, it was just like embarrassing to be around, you know, mm. like they'd be, at, we'd be at a restaurant and they'd start screaming at each other, mm. like on the top of their lungs. And everyone in the restaurant is like, like, what the fuck? You know, like what is wrong with these people? Mm. And like, she'd go run off to the bathroom and cry and he'd run after her, baby, baby, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say, uh, Oh, 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 I'm gonna buy you a diamond I swear you know <laughs> like he would like start like promising oh we're gonna go on a cruise we're gonna do it he starts like promising her the world you know? and she's like I don't care you're a piece of shit and you know <laughs> it's like you know I don't mean that <laughs> it's like just like okay. it was just like a huge huge drama constantly the way he is actually funny I was there when he met her we were in a in a club in Purdy Lounge in South Beach for for those who know um and he he like she's like sitting there like by herself i think her friend went to the bathroom or something so he sits down on the couch next to her and he like looks at her and he's like you do coke <laughs> great intro <laughs> wow. great. that's his first line and she goes uh not in a long time and he's like you want some and she's like Okay. <laughs> and so they go That's to love. the bathroom. And that, and that was the start of a great Keep relationship. Love at first line. Yeah, exactly. Cupid was in that club. Love at first line. I love that. Love at first line. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. So, anyway, so he, he, uh, he met her. I, I'm not going to mention her name because sure, she, it sure. was yeah. very traumatic for her that entire. And she was a very sweet girl, actually. When she wasn't around him, mm. she was actually very, very nice. And uh, we, we became friendly, you know, like we were friends. And, um, and she would, like, confide in me about her problems with him and, and, and all that. I was kind of, like, almost like her therapist at, at times. Uh, not so much for him. He just didn't give a shit. You know, he was like... You know, like, oh, bitch problems, you know, mm. <laughs> you know like mm. he didn't like it didn't it didn't seem to like really affect him uh, internally, uh, his his uh, relationship drama, um, just very externally. Did anything affect him? Um, he like he would get pissed off when he would think that he's getting the raw end of the deal, you know, like he, so he would get angry and things like that, but I'd never seen him like depressed or sad or anything like that. Um, or concerned for anybody. He just didn't really care. He, so I realized that he was different, uh, than most people like internally, not just externally. Um, I realized this the first time I realized it was, um, was we were going, we went to a gun show in Orlando. It's just one of these uh, normal gun shows that, that, um, that occasionally happen. And um, we were driving back together. He was driving and um, we were driving back from Orlando to Miami. And we were on one of these roads where there's no, it's like completely straight, straight as a ruler. There's only two lanes, one going in each direction and with like just a dividing line, you know, not a, a median or anything. Um, and uh, there were no street lights, and he's going like 80 miles an hour down the road. The car's coming in the opposite direction. It's at night, and he's got his brights on. And uh, I told him, like, Ephraim, you know, you shouldn't have your brights on when there's oncoming traffic. And he's like, well, why not? You know, I, I got to see the road. And I told him, well, because if you blind the other driver, they can crash. And he's like, who gives a shit? I got to see the road, you know? And I said, well, yeah, but they can crash into us. Yeah. And he's like, oh, oh, yeah, that's a good point. And he turns down his sprites. <laughs> wow. I'm like, oh, that's yeah. what mattered. Yeah. Like, he literally did not care. Is that care. a sociopath? Or? Yeah, that, I think you would. I'm, I'm no psychologist, right. but yeah. I think you would call that someone uh, wow. who is a sociopath. sociopath. It's someone who just does not physically possess empathy for mm. other people. He just, like, did not care. That's at all, like physically unable to care. Sure. And um, so that's when you noticed it. So that's when I realized this guy is not a normal guy. Did you start to get worried about your own stake in the company at that point? Um, so I was always kind of nervous about him to a some extent, um, like ever since the beginning, because I would see the shady things he would pull. Um, like, for example, uh, one, the, the first time I got nervous of just doing business with him was uh i think it was within the first two months that i was working with him uh i was working on like a fuel contract and he was uh he got a call from one of his connections uh to um for a request for arms from the king of nepal 
and the king of Nepal at the time was facing down a like a pro-democracy rebellion. Like he had a lot of protests. Uh, I don't think it was a violent rebellion at the time, but it, there were a lot of protests um, it, uh, demanding democ- democracy in in Nepal. And uh, the king asked for a package that included attack helicopters, heavy machine guns, riot gear, gas, a lot of stuff to put down protests uh, with varying levels of violence. And uh, he was super excited about this. He's like, oh, where he's like, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to put together a save the king package. And I told him, like, Ephraim, uh, are you sure that's legal? Because... Sounds like something the State Department wouldn't be too happy supporting a king who's crushing democracy, pro-democracy protests. And he's like, he goes to me, he's like, uh, and I'm like, and even if it is legal, which I don't think it is, that's pretty fucked up, you know? <laughs> and he goes to me, he's like, just work on your fuel contracts, bro. Leave this to me, okay? <laughs> oh, D- don't worry about it. You, you just do you. And, uh, you know, you just don't worry about this. And I'm like, oh, crap. This guy is, like, doing some serious shit. And I'm fucking in the same room as him. I know about it. I don't know whether that makes me legally liable or not. I mean, I'm not benefiting from it. I'm not making money. I'm not working on it. But I know about it. And um, and who knows what else he's going to do? I mean, sure. if he has no problem doing this, what else is he going to do? So that was that point gave me real pause about working with him. But I told myself, I'm like, you know, yeah, he's a shady fucker. And... Um, very difficult to deal with on a personal level, you know, with the whole fighting constantly getting into fights in nightclubs and constantly insisting I do cocaine with him and stuff like that, uh, which I mostly didn't, but you know, occasionally he would, he just wouldn't stop bothering me until I would. And uh, he's very insistent. That that was one of his strategies. He would just bother you like consistently until you give up. He did this with with the girl that he met actually. So after he met, I'm, I know I'm going on a tangent, but he's going, he, when he met her in the club and they did Coke together, like he got her number, I guess she was coked up and she gave him his, her number. He called her up the next day and she didn't pick up the phone. So he called her up again and again and again and again Sales. and again. And he's a salesman. He showed me his call log. He called her 34 times what? before she answered. <laughs> What How did you get that? blocked? <laughs> I don't know why she put up with it. And I really don't know why she agreed to go out on a date with him oh uh, after that. You know, she was like, fine, fine. I'll go out. Like he pretty much like wow. bullied her into going oh on a date God. with her. And yeah, she's like, fine, just to shut you up. I'm going go, <laughs> you know, to go out on a date with you. And that was the beginning of a long and very toxic relationship. It lasted like two years, something like that. They were together. Wow, um, wow. The whole time I was working with them, they were together and mm-hmm. on and off. I mean, they were breaking up literally every other day and then getting back together. So, but, yeah, so I, so th- w- I, after I saw the whole King of Nepal thing, mm-hmm. um, I was very nervous, obviously, for obvious reasons. And, but I told myself, I said, you know, this guy's shady, but he knows how to make a lot of money. That's for sure. Yeah. So I'm just going to stick it out. I'll make a few million dollars, just a few. I don't need to make a, a, you know, tens and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars from just a few million, maybe five. Right. <laughs> and, then I'm and, out. and then I'm out and then I'm out <laughs> and then I'll go and I'll pursue my music career. I'm a musician. So I, oh, I figured, you know, with a million dollars of advertising, I could make myself a rock star. Right. Uh, and that's of course, every, every young man's dream is to, uh, is to be playing stadiums and hanging out with groupies. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, what else is there? Right. So, <laughs> For sure. yeah. Um, so I, I figure I'll just put up with this guy for a year or two, make my money, get out, never have to deal with him again. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that was the plan, um, uh, did end up only being a year or two and I ended up only working with him for a bit under two years. Uh, didn't end the way I wanted. That's for sure. Does it feel like a lifetime? But, Oh man, it was, it was definitely by far the most stressful period of my life sure. because he was just a very hard person to work with. Like he's just, he was constantly turned up to 11. Mm-hmm. So like always like, and with drama with everything. So like always yelling, always screaming, like calling me up at three in the morning, get to the fucking office right now. We got to do this, blah, 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 you know? Yeah. And like, and he did this to everyone. It wasn't just me. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, he was, uh, everyone in the office who he hired hated him <laughs> and, uh, a lot of people quit. There was a lot of turnover. Uh, he made, I, I, he, we had a few girls who worked in the office. Um, 
and he like made some of them cry you know it was just really nasty it was nasty it was a it was not he was not a nice person to work with uh but i told myself and just put up with him put up with him for a few years just a couple of years make your money get out and that was the plan uh of course now nowadays i question I'm like what if i did make that money what if i made five million i'd be like well then if i just stick out for another year i can make another 10 million if another year after that and make another 50 million right and like at what point do you really stop uh, like so in a way i'm kind of glad that it it blew up in my face and uh i didn't end up a, a lifetime of stuck to him yeah. uh and working with him and and doing shady probably shadier and shadier things as time <laughs> went on and probably would have gotten me in much bigger trouble than i eventually got in so uh so i'm kind of glad of the way it happened I, I feel honestly i feel very 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 lucky mm. um that uh of the way it turned out mm. uh so yeah so so you contact the attorney after you leave his office right right what happens so next? i contact my attorney my attorney is like yeah we could sue him uh, i think you've got a good case you obviously have a lot of proof that you've done uh, lots of work on this contract he obviously owes you something and uh there were some arguments by email where there were some like relative broad numbers about what we were arguing so there was some stuff to go on and getting ready to file my lawsuit and uh, he tried to like to uh, to settle, but for a very tiny amount, like pennies on the dollar. And I was like, fuck you. You know, I'm not going to let you take ninety nine percent of what you owe me. And um, uh, getting ready to file the lawsuit about a month and a half uh, after I left the company, after I quit, um, I get a phone call from one of the girls who works at the office. And she's like, hey, I just wanted to let you know but uh, the feds just raided the office. And I said, the feds, holy crap, what are, did they say what it's about? And they're like, no, they didn't tell us what it's about, uh, but they just told everyone to step away from their computers and they're taking everyone's computers and they're boxing up all the files, all the filing cabinets and they're taking everything. And they told us all to step out of the office so that we couldn't interfere. And I was like, oh fuck, we're fucked. Wow. You know? I knew right away, I'm like, There's, if they don't already know, they're gonna find out. And so I And this was how long after you guys about had a month out? and a half. A month and a uh, half. About a month and a half. I was just coming out of my depression from of of having the last two years of my life go down the toilet. Um and and along with all my savings that I've been like living off and about to be literally broke and um and having a kid to feed so i was just getting out of it and i was uh realizing you know what i don't need this fucker i could do the business on my own i should start my own company and just start bidding on contracts i know all i know everything i know i know the the sources i know the uh the system so i was getting ready to do that and uh, so you were going to bid contracts so on i was own. planning on bidding contracts and i um the the feds raid the office and they, um, and I, immediately I, I'm like, okay, well, what's what's going on here? So I call up my buddy Alex, who's still in Albania, right? He he was uh, supervising the repackaging thing there, and he, Alex and I are best friends. We've known each other since like third grade. Uh, which is one of the reasons uh, I lobbied to get him hired. I told Ephraim we should hire Alex. Alex is a very smart guy, very capable. He'd been in the French military, so he had some military experience. He speaks three languages. Um, uh, degree in international relations, not that that matters so much but uh, <laughs> for this particular job. But, um, but he was a smart guy, worldly guy. Um, and so I called up Alex and I'm, I said, hey, you know, uh, I just heard that the feds raided the office. Uh, and he goes, what? He's like, what's, uh, he's like, let me call them up and see what's going on. So Alex calls up Ephraim and, uh, Danny answers the phone. Danny is, uh, uh the guy who, uh, took over my job after I quit. So Danny answers the phone and Alex is like, Hey, um, he wanted to feel him out a bit to see what was going on. So, uh, Alex asks him, he's like, hey, uh, I need um, uh, uh, these documents uh, f to give to the logistics people. Um, can you get that to me? And he hears, he, Alex tells me, he's like, he hears Danny covering the phone and whispering to Ephraim. He's like, hey, it's Alex. Uh, he says he needs these documents. So what should I tell him? Because they had been kicked out of the office. They couldn't access the documents who were getting taken by the, by the feds. And Ephraim goes, 
oh shit, we can't get them. Those documents, the feds have it. Uh, uh, tell them, tell them that uh, that there was a bomb threat and uh, and that we can't. We, everyone had to leave the, the 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 office. Yeah, tell them there was a bomb threat, so we can't access documents. But we'll get it to him later. And so Danny gets back in the point. He's like, uh, there was a bomb threat, so uh, we can't <laughs> we can't get you the documents. We should be able to get it to you uh, later in a few hours, maybe. And Alex is like, why are they lying to me? You know, what's going on? Like, why are they? Why why won't they tell me the truth? Um, and so Alex figures, well, maybe in Ephraim's mind, Ephraim's planning on pinning everything on him. And because Alex knows that. Alex. Yeah, Alex knew. I mean, he's, okay. he's supervising the repackaging operation. Okay. <laughs> he knew about it. He didn't actually think it was a big deal legally because he, because he, is, uh, he has a degree in international relations. He knows that the stuff didn't actually violate the embargo. So he thought, oh, this is like a commercial matter. You know, okay, it's a, a breach of contract commercial thing. Okay, well, they're going to sue him. They're not going to, it's not a criminal thing, right? Which is what it should have been. Uh, I mean, what, it should have been a commercial matter, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in my opinion. But then again, I'm not a lawyer, right? But um, uh, so he he figures Alex thinks, well, Ephraim's probably lying to me because uh, he's going to try to pin everything on him. That, you know, oh, I had no idea that this was stuff. This was all Alex's idea to repackage the thing. He's the guy on the ground. He's the one doing it. So... Um, Alex is like, there's no way I'm going down for this fucker. I mean, he was getting a salary. He wasn't even getting a percentage of the deal or anything. And it was a decent salary, but it wasn't not, nothing crazy. I mean, he wasn't making a huge amount of money or anything like that. He wasn't going to go down with the ship. Exactly. There's no reason for him to go down with the ship, mm -hmm. uh, especially since it sounds like the captain's trying to pin it on him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, trying to, it's trying to jump ship and leave him behind. And so Alex is on the next flight out. And he, he's, he comes back to Miami. Both him and I hire an attorney. And our attorneys tell us, well, first thing you got to do is you got to go through your emails and see what kind of evidence the government might have, because for sure the government already has all your emails. I mean, they don't do uh, raids unless they're already they already have done everything prior to that that they can. They'll probably they'll they'll get. Uh, um, you know, permission from the judge, a warrant to go into your emails and do all the electronic surveillance first. Uh, they may have even bugged your phones for all we know. Who knows? Do we, you don't know how far they've gone, right? And so we went through our emails and we realized there was a lot of, lot of evidence, a lot of evidence against us. At first, when we first decided to repackage the stuff, um, we were uh, Ephraim was like, okay, nothing's going in writing. We're doing everything over the phone. But then, as a few weeks went by, and people's um, because there were people in Albania, there were, there were uh, people we had to talk to in Afghanistan and in the United States, so all these different time zones, and we were working really long hours. We got really exhausted, and there was uh, deadlines we had to meet. The the aircraft was going to land in Albania tomorrow, and you needed to get the documents to Alex before the aircraft lands. But you have to make sure that that the stuff was repackaged in this way before. So we were like. It, it, it got to a point where it didn't like it was too much of a hassle to get everyone on the phone all the time to talk about the uh, about the incriminating stuff, and so we just started got typing it up. Sloppy. But yeah, we stopped mm. being careful. We started writing it by email. So because of that, there was some pretty rock solid evidence about the scheme. Uh, there was literally email saying, "Don't forget to make sure that there's no uh, Chinese documents <laughs> in the repackaged ammo." Right? It was just like total, totally obvious. Hmm. There was no denying it. Dead rights. Well, yeah, exactly, Dead, yeah. exactly. Dead rights. Yeah. And so uh, we showed the, these emails to our lawyer, and he said, "He's like, look, you know, they've got pretty solid evidence against you, and uh, you know, you could fight them." but it's going to cost you like two, 300 grand if you want to take this to court. Do you guys have two to 300 grand? And neither of us did. <laughs> and uh, the, the, our lawyer was like, well, do your parents own a house? Maybe they could remortgage the house. And we're like, we're not doing that to our parents. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to take my parents' house away so I could maybe beat the, beat the feds in court. And, and probably not <laughs> because there's such strong evidence against us and so he's like well in that case your best bet if you're not going to fight him in court is to cooperate um so our lawyer calls up the the fed federal agents and they're like the feds 
um, arrange an interview with us and they tell us and you know they ask us of course they don't tell the, us what they know and they want to hear everything from us first we tell them every, and the way it works is if you cooperate you have to cooperate all the way like if you leave any part out like you get nothing right you know you have to cooperate 100 percent. and if they think that you're being if you tell them one lie it invalidates any any credit you get for cooperating so uh, so we had to just tell them everything we knew. And after we were done, they, uh, one of them, one of the agents, I, I remember he, he laughs. He's like, he's like, actually, we, we already know about all the Chinese stuff because when we raided the office, uh, we found a, a to-do list on Ephraim's desk <laughs> in his handwriting. And one of the items was repackaged Chinese <laughs> ammo. <laughs> um, so, awesome. So yeah. <laughs> in this moment in time, you're probably looking down the barrel of, you know, some yeah. years in jail. Yeah. Um, did you know the severity at the time or were you just kind of going through the process? So we didn't know what they were going to charge us with because we weren't sure what the crime was exactly. Mm. Um, you thought it might be a civil matter. Well, we thought it might be if it was a civil matter, then there's no crime. Then it's just a matter of money. Right. And then they could sue us. But that's Ephraim. It's Ephraim's money. He didn't pay us anything. So um, so it would be an issue for him. Uh, but. It, there was the possibility of fraud, which is what they ended up charging with us with, and that has a a very large uh, element of how much money is considered, you know, uh, was involved in the fraud. And the more money, the more years you get in prison. And we weren't sure how they would calculate that because if you defraud someone out of three hundred million dollars, you will spend the rest of your life in prison, right? But did we defraud them out of 300 million? Because they didn't actually lose any money. In fact, they saved a lot of money. So what, what is the loss in the fraud? The way they ended up calculating it later was the cost for them to take the contract away from us and give it to someone else, which they the calculated. Difference. Yeah, they, exactly. They, well, it, it, not, not the difference in, in the cost of the contract. It was the cost of them canceling our contract and rebidding it out. Got it. So, which they estimated at one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Not too bad. Okay. Yeah, a lot, a lot better than uh, than three than three hundred million. Uh, and were you still fulfilling the contract up to this point? Uh, yeah. No, we continued fulfilling the contract. Mm -hmm. So, even after the feds raided the office, Ephraim kept delivering. Oh wow. Yeah, and so it came out in court later that that the that the Justice Department sent a letter to the U.S. Army. Uh, informing them that the ammo was Chinese and that it may violate U.S. law. They weren't sure, right? Uh, and that they recommend that they stop taking delivery on it. And the Army wrote a letter back to them saying the ammo is mission critical and they will only stop taking delivery on it if they receive a letter from the Attorney General of the United States. Mm. you know, the head of the Justice Department. And that letter never arrived. Why is anybody's guess, right? Uh, maybe it just kind of slipped through the cracks. Maybe they made a decision not to, you know, to look the other way. Who knows? But the Army knew about it. They for sure knew about it. That's been documented in court. And uh, they kept on taking delivery for another six months. Um, and wow. uh, yeah, exactly. Good money. Yeah, oh, yeah. And they delivered a lot of ammo during that time, kept on delivering. Uh, during this entire six-month period, the feds told me and Alex, well, you know, we're not 100% sure whether we're going to take this case to court. Thank you for your cooperation. If we do take it to court, we're, you are not our target. Ephraim is the target. You guys didn't even make any money from this. So you guys are just witnesses. We're not going to go after you. Uh, we're just going to go after him. And we're not even sure if we're going after him yet. We have to kind of, you know, we're still doing our research, right? And then about six months later, you know, at that point, I was like, um, I thought, uh, I thought this thing had just uh, gone away. I thought, okay, they're just going to let this go. They want the ammo. They're not going to make a big stink out of this. So I was like breathing a big sigh of relief. I got back on starting my own company to do the government contracts. Um, I bid on this one, this contract that I was going to make is for uh, heavy machine gun ammo that I had a really good source for that Ephraim did not have because I had met this particular source at a, uh, at a trade show. And, uh, and we go into how to meet amazing sources in War Dogs Academy. War Dogs Academy. <laughs> so, War Dogs Academy. So, so make sure you sign up. Um, 
uh, lots of lots of great tips and tricks that we've all developed over the years uh, to to uh, and to meet great sources. And of course, a good source can make you millions of dollars. Oh, yes. You know, all you need yeah, is that's one probably connection. Probably the most important thing, yeah, honestly. Absolutely, it's it's your competitive advantage. Uh, yeah. over all your competitors in the in the government contracting space. So I made a great connection uh, with someone uh, at a trade show that Ephraim, that I knew Ephraim did not know. And he happened to have uh, a supply of this particular ammo that I was bidding on. I knew Ephraim was bidding on it too, but I knew that he did not have this price. And so, and I knew all the other prices because I knew all of Ephraim's sources. So I knew that there was a decent margin in there because this guy happened to have access to um, to stuff that was uh, um, it was a, a stock material, right? Stuff that's been sitting in a warehouse for like a decade or two, and so they were willing to sell it real cheap, still in perfectly good condition, but they were willing to sell it really cheap, way cheaper than new production, which is what Ephraim was bidding on. And so I knew that there was a very large margin there. So I bid it at a decent margin that it was still going to win the contract, but was going to make me about a million and a half dollars, just this one contract. Wow. And it was my first contract. And I got a notification from the government that they wanted to uh, start the audit procedures. So I knew I was in the running. I was hmm. either the top guy or one of the top people. And they said, okay, we well, need to do the financial audit. The, the whole thing that we went through with Afghanistan, uh, to a lesser degree because it was a much smaller contract. But they wanted to start the audit procedures. And so I was like, holy crap, I might actually win this contract and make a million and a half dollars. Pretty <laughs> sweet on my own. Uh, fuck that guy. I don't need him. <laughs> you know. And, um, and uh, literally the next day after I got that notice, that they were going to do the audit, uh, I uh, the New York Times published a front page oh, article, no. front page article with mine and Ephraim's mug shots on the oh, front page, no. and it was our mug Brutal. shots were right next to this picture of rusty looking ammunition uh, that they claimed was all the stuff we were delivering to Afghanistan. It wasn't actually we did deliver that particular ammunition to Afghanistan. It was rejected. It was uh, about thirty thousand rounds out of like 200 million total so a tiny fraction of a percent he had bought those 30,000 rounds actually in, in Bulgaria it wasn't even the Chinese stuff from Albania he had bought those rounds from Bulgaria sight unseen because it was such a small amount of rounds that it wasn't even worth the plane ticket to go inspect it his thinking was you know this stuff is so cheap I'll try to deliver it if they take it great if they don't it's not such a big loss because I'm buying it for so cheap but if they take it then it's a huge margin so um uh, he bought it sight unseen, turned out to be total crap, and they rejected it, and they pushed it to the side. There was no, there's no um, uh, ammunition demilitarizing uh, uh, demil facilities there, so they couldn't send it off to a company to take it apart. Uh, in Afghanistan, there nothing like that exists. They didn't want to ship it back anywhere. That costs money. So they just put it to the side of the runway of the, of the airport uh, out of the way, and just let it sit there. And so when the New York Times went after Costa told them about what we were doing, they started an investigation. Took, they did like a whole six months of investigation before they published. They sent someone to a reporter to Afghanistan and the reporter asked around uh, and they're like, uh, AEY Inc., do you, they, can I see some of the stuff they delivered? And they're like, oh yeah, that stuff at the side of the, uh, of the uh, airport is some of the stuff they delivered. So he goes and he sees this pile of rusty looking ammunition gets a bunch of pictures of that, assumes that's pretty much uh, indicative of everything that we're delivering, and they write the article in that way that we are delivering uh, defective, low-quality ammunition, and we're putting our Afghan allies at risk, and we're uh, um, you know a couple of teenage sto like guys in their young twenties, stoners. Um, and so we, our nickname in the in the media became the Stoner Arms Dealers. <laughs> um, and uh, it became a huge uh, scandal because we were so young and uh, the New York Times made it look like it was uh, much more incompetent than it actually was. So uh, Congress decided to hold hearings on it. There's still clips on YouTube of them. Wolf Blitzer. Yes, Wolf Blitzer. Yep. Uh, they used his clip in the movie. Great clip. Yeah, yeah. And um, and there's clips from Congress from the floor of Congress mm -hmm. uh, where they have like pictures of our ammo. They're like, this is the stuff that they're delivering. How could the government trust these couple of kids to deliver this stuff? What were you thinking stuff? at the time? 
I was thinking I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that's, that's what I was thinking. That's, I'm like, holy yeah. crap, I'm fucked. Congress is talking about your company you're t- in your 20s, your yeah. early 20s. Yeah. You know, what could, what's going through your head? You're just, I'm going to jail. Yeah, that's pretty much and what I was Ephraim. thinking. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, that's, I've been thinking for at least uh, eight months at that <laughs> Probably point. Probably the whole time you were working with yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole time I was thinking about that. But um, <laughs> especially in the last eight months after when, when I realized he was, he was not going to pay me anything. Um, I'd spent the last two years of my life working for nothing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was thinking I'm really screwed because uh, I had every reporter in the world trying to get through to me. My phone was ringing off the hook. My, I, my attorney told me, don't talk to anybody. Um, the, the worst thing you could do right now is talk to reporters. And so I just ignored them all. Uh, but uh, eventually... Um, uh, Rolling Stone reached out to me and they're like, Hey, this is an amazing story. We really want to write this story. And I said, look, you know, I'm a musician. I've always dreamed about being in Rolling Stone, <laughs> just not for this. <laughs> 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 and, and my lawyer says, I can't talk to any press. I'm sorry. And so the writer, Guy Lawson, um, he goes to me, he's like, you know, I actually used to be a lawyer too before I became a journalist. So why don't you let me talk to your lawyer? Maybe we could arrange something. And so I put him through to my lawyer and he, um, he gives my lawyer a guarantee that he won't publish anything until after all legal jeopardy has passed. And my lawyer says, oh, if he gives that guarantee, then it's okay. You could talk to him. So he interviewed me. He ended up having to wait three years to publish that article hmm. because that's how long the, um, the uh, legal issues stretched out for. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, so he, so after like a week after the New York times got, um, oh, and, and the Rolling Stone, the reason I mentioned it, the Rolling Stone article is how the movie got made because Todd Phillips, the director of war dogs saw, uh, the article in Rolling Stone in 2011 and thought that no, that's a really cool story. I could mm. make a movie out of this. And, uh, he was in the middle of filming, uh, hangover two, and then he decided to do hangover three. So it got delayed until 2015 and then war dogs came out in 2016. But, um, and so that's how Hollywood got a uh, hold of the story. But, um, uh, a week after, it's actually like three days after the uh, New York Times published their article, uh, my lawyer calls me up and he's like, uh, he's like, hey, listen, the Justice Department decided that they're going to have to charge you. Oh, no. Yeah. And then the Army went out, went and put, the U.S. Army put a uh, press release out saying, we had no idea about yeah, any of, of this. We are shocked and appalled and we're <laughs> going to take action, in more or less those words. Um, and so they canceled Ephraim's contract like a mm. week later. And so the delivery stopped at that point in like March of 2018. So that was about six months after they raided the... Uh the uh, they raided in August and they canceled it in March, mm. end of March, early April. Yeah. So he yeah. came away with some cash out of that. Contract. Oh yeah, no, I I estimate that he he probably made in profit. He, I know he delivered about he delivered. I think it was sixty seven million dollars worth. Wow. wow. Yeah. So he made between fifteen and twenty million in profit from Man. from the contract. And they did they seize that money? They didn't. They didn't. They didn't. And the, and the only, he had to pay a fine of 500 grand. You're kidding me. What? Yeah. So he got to keep all the profit. He got to keep it all. Wow. I did not know that. Yeah, he did. And the reason is, is because it's, as I said, it was there, it's very hard for them to, to show damages, right? Hmm. When someone is defrauded, you say, I was defrauded out of money. Right. And that person caused me to lose this money. Therefore, I want that money back. And that person should get the money he got. He made off of me. I should you should get it taken away from him. Right. But Ephraim actually saved the government at least 50 million dollars. Right. Hmm. And uh, and and the government, the only loss they had was taking the contract away from him and giving it to someone else, which they estimated 150 grand. And then they on top of that, they tacked on like a like a penalty of like 300 grand so i think he paid a total of like 450 and change wow. in in uh and that was all he paid he did get sentenced to four years in prison so that's not nothing but that was mostly because he was an idiot he probably could have gotten away with a year max uh if he had just 
done things correctly like I did. So what was he so, fighting against it the entire time? So the way, the way, so the way it worked was this, <laughs> when they charged us with, um, uh, they, they said, you guys, you guys delivered, um, 71 aircraft loads of this Chinese origin ammo. And each aircraft load, there was a document that you had to submit with that aircraft load uh, called a COC, a certificate of conformance. And in the certificate of conformance, there was the listing of all the, st the, st the quantity of ammo on the plane, the, the type of ammo it was, the year of manufacturing, and most crucially, the place of origin. And the place of origin, you guys put Albania and you knew it was China. And not only did you know, but you had a whole operation to hide the fact that it was China. And therefore, it was willful fraud. You defrauded the government out of the ammo that they contracted you to give them, which was non-Chinese origin ammo, right? That's the fraud. Now, each of these documents, each of these certificate of conformance documents that you submitted with each aircraft load is an act of fraud. Mm. And there were 71 aircraft. Oh, man. Wow. So 71 acts of fraud, and each act of fraud can get you up to five years in prison. And so if you fight us and you go to court, we're going to charge you with everything. And you can get five years each, and you can get to spend 355 years in prison max, right? Even if you get a, only a fraction of that, that could be the rest of your life, right? But if you plead guilty... As prosecutors, we have the leeway to combine all those acts into one. So it won't be 71 acts, it'll be one act of fraud, and you get maximum five years in prison, and because you plead guilty, we'll tell the judge that uh, you know, you're very sorry, and you're a reformed citizen, you'll be a good boy from now on, and therefore <laughs> the judge should go light on you and give you the lower end, maybe, maybe a year instead of five years. So, but that's only if you plead guilty, otherwise we go for the max. So... Alex and I, I mean, we didn't have any choice because we, we didn't even have, even if we wanted to fight them, we didn't have the money to do it. Ephraim had the money. Mm -hmm. So he at first decided to fight them and he hired the best lawyers in, in, uh, he hired Roy Black, who's a very famous attorney in Miami. He's like the most expensive attorney in Miami. Roy Black, this is back then. He's probably even more expensive now required a million dollar retainer. Wow. One million dollars just to take your case. Wow. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so he hired Roy Black. Uh, they went back and forth with the government for like a couple years. Uh, eventually, they, Ephraim realized that he's not going to get out of it and that, that he could continue fighting them, but he's probably going to lose. And so eventually he pled guilty as well. Now, part of the plea agreement when you plead guilty, you sign a document that admits all the things you did, right? And the government, for their part, the prosecutors, they'll sign on the plea agreement that they will go to bat for you with the judge because the judge decides your sentence, right? There's, there are sentencing guidelines, but they're just guidelines. The judge has the leeway to give you more or less um, in most cases. And so uh, the prosecutors will say, well, if you sign this plea agreement and you admit your guilt and you save us the trouble of going to court, uh, we are going to ask the judge to be to give you on the more lenient end of the guidelines than on the harsher end of the guidelines, and so so uh, Ephraim signed the plea agreement, right? But part of the plea agreement and standard in every plea agreement is that you cannot commit any further crimes between now and when the judge sentences you, because how are they how are they going to tell the judge that you're a reformed citizen and you're going to be a good boy from now on if right. you're uh, if you're going out there and committing more crimes? Yeah. So uh, he signed the plea agreement, and the 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 agents the the prosecutors told him you can't stay in the arms business, right? You can, you have to get out of this. Um, so do and you do any other business, just stay out of the arms business. But of course, Ephraim is not that kind of guy, so he got a, uh, a new uh, best friend to start a company under his, under his friend's name and uh, tried to continue doing business under his friend's company. But he's such like a control freak that when it came down to negotiating the deals, he insisted on getting on the phone himself. Mm. And eventually it kind of came out who he was and he was trying to do a deal with a gun dealer in uh, near Orlando and uh, the guy figured out who he was 
and uh, um, Ephraim's like, yeah, yeah, I've got a bit of a reputation, you know. He, and he thought, Ephraim thought that the guy was totally cool with it uh, and was willing to continue doing the deal. What he didn't know is that the guy was quite nervous about suddenly discovering that he had a uh, convicted arms dealer trying to do b business with him because he already pled guilty, so he was convic officially convicted. And he uh, called up, the gun dealer called up the ATF, the Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms Administration, who regulates guns in the United States, and as well as tobacco and firearms and explosives, and uh, <laughs> and they have all the fun. They have the fun job, right? <laughs> and um, he called up the ATF and he told them, "Hey, I've got this convicted arms dealer who's trying to do this business with me. What should I do?" Uh, because he probably figured this guy is trying to entrap him into doing something mm. illegal. So in order to get his sentence reduced, so that's. I, I assume that's what he thought. And so he's like, I'm not falling for that. I'm going to call the feds first and make sure I don't get entrapped into anything. And so the ATF said, oh, that's really interesting. Why don't you uh, keep on talking to him? And why don't you introduce one of our undercover agents as your business partner? And so he introduces the undercover agent to Ephraim. And the undercover agent tells Ephraim, you know, I'd love to do this deal with you. Um, but I need a, I need a, you know, I need to do things. I do things face to face. So you got to come up to Orlando. You know, you're not, you're in Miami. You're not too far. Why don't you drive up to Orlando? We'll shake hands on it. We'll do this deal. And Ephraim's like, yeah, I totally get it. Face to face, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I, that's how I roll too. So uh, I'll be up there next weekend. Now, part of his uh, bond, when, when they charge you, right, you have to post bond to, to, get, to stay out of prison while, until trial, right? So he had posted bond, and part of the bond agreement was that he stay in South Florida. So he's not allowed to leave South Florida. He's not allowed to go to Orlando. The agent knew this. So the agent said, you have to come up to Orlando to do this deal. Hmm. Ephraim comes up to Orlando. The agent uh, meets him and uh, pops open the hood, the trunk of his car and, and takes out a HK handgun. And he's like, Hey, Ephraim, he's like, check this out. This thing's, uh, the latest handgun on the market. And he knew Ephraim was a gun nut, right? So he's like, check this out. The latest handgun on the market. This is so cool. Uh, and Ephraim's like, Oh yeah, I heard about that thing. That thing just came out. Let me see that. He picks it up. He's like, let's go to the range and fire off a few rounds because what can I say? Once a gun runner, always a gun runner. Am I right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and then the agent whips out cuffs, slams it on him. He's like, you're oh. under arrest. Oh. Felon in possession right of a firearm. Right there. Wow. Oh, man. He's like, you're a felon in possession of a firearm. You can no get 10 way. years for this. Man. Yeah. And so he got arrested right there. And because he had violated his bond in Miami, they didn't offer him a bond for this arrest, oh. for the second arrest. Yeah. So he had to stay in jail for like a year before the judge even like sentenced him. Wow. Yeah. And that's on top of the four years that he got. Yeah. From so the no. So they, they counted the time okay. served. Time yeah. Served, yeah. So they, they counted that. Uh, but so he could have gotten a total of. 10 years for the gun charge and five years max for the, uh, for the fraud charge that he pled guilty to. Um, but he had Roy Black on, on retain on his very expensive retainer and, uh, uh Roy, uh, negotiated down to four years for a combined mm. for mm. both, for both charges. Wow. So, yeah. And he, and I think he got, ended up getting out in three and a half for good behavior or something mm. like that. So pays to have a good lawyer. Yeah. 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 yeah, sure. yeah. Oh, you have to pay to have a good lawyer. <laughs> yeah. So did you, ever, yeah. did you ever think that about... Was, that was the minimum. Yeah, I think he ended up spending two or three oh, man. in total. Yeah. Did you ever think yeah. about going after him for your share of that contract? Yeah, I was going to say. After the fact. So Definitely. I did sue him um, late, much years later because um, it, it would have been hard to sue him while in prison. And then there was like the whole... The, the the movie thing came up and that like mm -hmm. interfered with things. And so the, the, the lawsuit got delayed for various reasons. And eventually I did file a lawsuit against him. And um, there, was a, uh, there was a particular uh, bit of evidence that I needed that I didn't have, that he had. And I was trying to like get the judge to, uh, to get him to turn that over to us. And then the judge made some sort of ruling where I would have to like pay for like this whole like discovery like system, which would have cost me like 150 grand. And at the time I didn't have the money and, uh, and like the statute of limitations was coming up. And so I was like, 
you know what? Uh, eventually, I just settled with him, and I got a hmm. fraction of what oh, he God. owed me, a, fra- yeah. a very small fraction wow. of what he owed me. But I just, at that point, I was like, you know what? I just want this guy out of my life. Sure. I'm like, I don't even, yeah, I just didn't want to spend the next years of my life is in and out of a courtroom you wanted to move with him. On. I wanted to move on. I already, my other business was starting to take off and I was like, I want to concentrate on that. Yeah, sure. So, so since yeah. all of this happened, have you, do you know where he is at now or so do you have any idea? From what I hear, he's still living in Miami mm-hmm. and I heard he got married and I heard oh, wow. he just had a kid also. Wow. So Look I wish that. them all the best of luck. Look at that. Yeah. 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 So that's yeah an amazing story. Yeah. yeah. So I guess one of the main questions is, can people still do this? Yeah. Is this still a thing? Of course people can do it. You know, this is one of the things that people always ask me uh, is they, everyone assumes that the government closed all the loopholes and everything's watertight and you can't make any money anymore. And that's actually couldn't be further from the, from the truth. And you guys are proof of that. Yeah. Um, it, it's uh, from what I've heard, from people still in the industry, such as yourselves and other people that I know who are who are in the industry, it's pretty much more or less the exact same system that they had uh, 15 years ago while when I was in the business, and uh, except that they made the website slightly worse yeah. and harder to navigate. Much worse. Yeah, much worse. And um, but we have but we teach you how to use that. We're going to teach you how to use that uh, website and the best way to go about it in War Dogs Academy. So <laughs> so sign up to War Dogs Academy. War Dogs Academy. That's right. War Dogs Academy. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there is there's more money being spent by the government than ever before. Mm-hmm. More money. If you look at the government's budget, it just increases every year. Six point mm-hmm. seven trillion last year. Trillion with a T. With a yeah. T. With a T. Of that, around eight hundred billion with a B is spent by the Pentagon. So that's just the military budget is almost a trillion dollars. Um, but and the Pentagon, as well as the rest of the government, they buy everything. Uh, people think that it's just like an arms dealing thing, but it's really not. It's mm-hmm. they literally buy everything. I mean, you guys specialized in laundry services of all things, <laughs> and there's a huge amount of money in laundry. Yeah. There's Absolutely. a huge amount of money in socks. There's a huge amount of money in fuel, in yeah. food, in air conditioning, in, in uh, security services. Yeah. There's literally everything. The, gover- the, the federal government is the single largest customer in the world, period, by far, multiple times over. Single, single, the, 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 by far the biggest single entity uh, that buys anything anywhere. And if you could sell to the federal government the sky's the limit. You can make a massive, massive amount of money. And uh, knowing how it works gives you a huge competitive advantage because a lot of private companies don't want to deal with the government because the, dealing with the government is a pain in the butt. Mm-hmm. And it, it has a lot of loopholes, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, things that you have to go through, uh, a lot of... A lot of um, uh, barriers to entry. There's a, a lot of uh, difficult to understand regulations and documentation requirements, and that scares off a lot of even large private companies. Oh, yeah. uh, don't bother selling to the government because they figure they have enough business selling to other private companies, and they don't have to deal with the huge hassle of selling to the government. So there is uh, plenty of space both for private companies to sell the goods that they specialize in to the government, but also for brokers such as ourselves who are just middlemen between private industry and the government. And that's what we were doing as we were just uh, brokering, buying and selling, buying from suppliers, selling to the government, collecting a profit. We specialized in military equipment, but but the government buys everything. So yep. you can specialize. You guys specialized in uh, in laundry services. I know someone who specialized in food. I know someone who specialized in boots. And uh, it, it's it, once you know how the system works, you have a huge advantage in the market, and there is enormous business opportunities. And that's why uh, we got together. We decided to start War Dogs Academy because. There's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of misinformation about the system of selling to the government. 
and they people think that is very very difficult uh and it's not easy i would never say that it's easy yeah but it's a lot easier if you could have someone else guide you on in the process of learning and getting yourself up to speed of how the whole system works save yourself huge amounts of headaches huge amounts of time and you'll make money a lot faster if you have someone knowledgeable guiding you through it and that was the inspiration to starting war dogs academy mm -hmm. yeah. you guys uh contacted me uh, i think maybe like a, a year ago or so roughly. Uh, roughly and at first you guys uh, we we wanted to uh, um, see if if I could get back into if into the arms business, and you guys wanted to expand your business from laundry into the stuff I specialized in. I haven't done government contracting in 15 years. I'm, I, for the last 15 years, I've been developing uh, uh, technology products for musicians. So yeah, um, after um, I got uh, I pled guilty. Uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the things that the the one part of the sentencing was that I was banned from doing business with the federal government until uh, 2022. Mm. So I was not allowed to. So I am currently allowed to do business with the federal government again. Um, but in the past, in and for the last uh, since 2008, when I was banned, um, I uh, obviously had to get into other businesses, other lines of work. And um, the genesis of my current main business, it was actually occurred while I was under house arrest. So while I, I got sentenced to seven months of house arrest, zero jail time, I was extremely lucky, very grateful. Um, and um, it, it was actually my, so when it came time to my, for my sentencing, my, uh, the prosecutors, asked my usually it's a negotiation between your attorney and the prosecutors uh, what they're going to recommend to the judge and usually the, the prosecutors are trying to you know recommend a higher sentence and the attorney is fighting for a lower sentence right when it came time to for them to negotiate my attorney told me he's like hey you know we're we're going to go for like zero jail time obviously i mean that's that's the goal here so i'm gonna you know you have to give them something so let's just say Let's offer them seven months house arrest, seven months probation, see what they say. You know, they'll probably negotiate up from there. And he said uh, they just accepted it the first thing. They're like, wow. yeah, sure, no problem. What a relief. I wow. know. And <laughs> then, of course, I thought, then I could have asked for less, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> the effort in you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I should have asked for nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Why did I get any house arrest? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they didn't, they, at first they said they weren't even going to charge me. So they said, oh, you're not a target of the investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as you cooperate, we're not going to come after you. And then after the New York Times published the article with my mugshot on the front page, they're like, look, you're too involved in the story. We can't uh, really charge Ephraim without charging you. So we're going to have to charge you. But we're still going to go to bat for you with the judge and make sure you get the minimum that we can. Mm -hmm. But we're very sorry. But, you know, and I'm like, well, thank you. Now I have a felony on my record and, mm, yeah. and all that implies. Uh, th you know, thank you very much. But at least they agreed not to send me to prison. So I am grateful for that. Um, could have been a lot worse. Uh, one thing I learned uh, as a very hard lesson that there's no amount of money in life that will miss you watching your kid grow up mm, yeah. so um i thought of that very often in the years since uh it's uh yeah i mean yes ephraim probably walked away with about 20 million dollars but he spent four years in prison and i wouldn't trade i wouldn't trade it honestly you wouldn't yeah. do that i don't think so i mean 20 million for four years. I think good. a lot of people would take that. I think a lot of people would take that. Four years is not the worst thing in the world. 10 years, for sure not. No. Yeah. I would not take yeah, $20, $20 million for 10 mm -hmm. years. I wouldn't even take $100 million you for 10 years. You also have a kid. I also you have a kid. Yeah, I feel like that yeah. changes. I feel like we yeah. would do that. I would do that. Would you do that? Four years? I don't know. I don't know if I'd survive in jail. Four years for $20 million? Yeah. I mean, what if you were in a, a nice... It, it was a mi it was not nice, but it's, it is minimum security. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> minimum security. Minimum security. Is it the white collar yes. uh, prison? Yes. Yeah, That's the white collar, yeah. Did you play tennis? I think they actually do have tennis You know how they have there. those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's the prison. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it, not a country club like people think it is. If yeah. anyone but, wants to offer us that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not It's not a country club. They call it the country club, but mm -hmm. that's only compared to other it's prisons. It's not the maximum that you see. No, it's yeah. not It's not the max. Yeah. yeah. I, I still I don't think I would. Yeah. Every time I go to the airport and um, I drive by that, that prison and mm -hmm. I see the guys working out there, I'm like, I would 
<laughs> not survive. Yeah. It would be a field day. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> I'd have to start a commissary business or something like that. Yeah. To show my family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, people people do it. Uh, yeah. You know, people less uh less uh physically imposing than you have survived. <laughs> no, so oh it, it does happen. Yeah. It does happen. But uh, I'm but, glad that, you know, yeah, you got no, what you I, got. I feel very sure. grateful for yeah. uh for uh very grateful for life in general and um in particular for avoiding prison time. Yeah. And uh but I've always had ever since the movie came out, ever since War Dogs came out I've every week I literally get like two to three people at least you know, messaging me saying, Hey, I just watched the movie, super inspiring, would love to learn how to do it. I'll work for you for free and yeah. give you half the profits. Just teach me what you know, you know? And um and I'm I'm too busy to do this, you know. I'm not going to to take on a, an apprentice. And uh but then uh Logan, you reached out to me and uh, you didn't, unlike all the other guys, you didn't say, Hey, I'm really desperate. Please help me teach me everything. You know, um, you said, you know, like five years ago, my partner and I, we watched war dogs and we were super inspired. And we thought if these guys could do it, then we could do it. Why don't we try to give it a shot? And you guys actually went and and you did it and you, uh, you put in the work and uh, eventually you succeeded, and now you guys have a multi-million dollar business, government contracting business. Uh, you specialize in, in laundry businesses, which I thought, <laughs> which, uh, laundry services, which I thought was super cool, just so random, right? And it just shows you the scope of government contracting, yeah. right? People mm. think they're going in to Absolutely. be an arms dealer, and they end up providing laundry services. Yeah. And it could be literally anything, and you can make millions of dollars off of laundry services. You could make millions of dollars off of literally anything the government buys the government buys everything and and um at first uh we were talking about maybe expanding your business into the arms trade and you uh, and me consulting with you guys on how to do that and then i realized well that's kind of thinking too small you know Mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who want to know how uh not just the arms trade but how to do government contracting in general so instead of looking at this just this tiny little slice of the pie which is the arms trade and it's a big it's a big it's a big slice right there's many billions of dollars being spent on arms but there's many trillions of dollars being spent on Mm -hmm. everything else and and why limit yourself money is money no matter how you make it uh as long as it's legal guys (laughs) (laughs) and then you get to keep it right and that's very important yes exactly exactly and so uh we had the idea instead of just uh, focusing on this narrow aspect of expanding your business into into an adjacent something else. Why don't we start something that can teach all the people who want to get into this business how to uh, how to uh, work government contracts, how to build a business, how to win bids, find sources, uh, arrange logistics, get the licensing. There's a lot of complexity here that we learned um, uh, through trial and error. Mm-hmm. And we've wasted a lot. Of, we we know we've wasted a lot of time if and we money. had someone Absolutely. and money, and potentially lost money yeah. um, because you had to learn it the hard way. You had to learn from experience. So uh, if we can build something that that takes away that learning curve, reduces the learning curve, it will give people such a huge leg up in the probability of success, as well as the timeline to uh, shorten of how long it takes for them to achieve success, that it could be something really significant. And and uh, after talking about it, uh, through with it uh, a bit more, we realized there is more than just knowing how to win contracts, how to find sources, how to arrange logistics. Uh, those are all critical uh, components of it. But one of the biggest things that that uh, a new entrant into the uh, into the government contracting business, one of the biggest barriers to entry uh, is financing, right? So when we got when uh, when Ephraim got into the business on his own, he had to have a connection with his dad to get Ralph involved to finance his deal. If Ralph wasn't there, who knows if Ephraim would have. Ephraim could have crashed and burned and never won another contract because he would have defaulted on that first contract. They would have never awarded him another one, right? So, uh, and without financing, you're dead in the water because you have to pay your supplier. You have to pay the logistics company. 
And then after you deliver 30 days later, if you're lucky, the government pays you. So you need the money to pay for all that. And if you don't have the money, you cannot deliver even if you win the contract. Mm -hmm. Even if the contract is awarded to you, you can fail on that. Even if everything else, if you have a great price from your supplier, you have a great price from your logistics provider, and everything's above board, the quality of the, of the stuff that you're delivering is perfect, but if you have no money, you're dead. So someone who's getting right into the business starting out usually does not have the connections to have that kind of financing. Now, on the bright side is that government contracts is one of the safest investments that an investor can make uh, because the government literally prints the money. So one of, when you're, if you're financing a deal, right, and it's a deal where you buy from one person and sell to the other, right, the risk there is that the person you're selling it to doesn't pay you right? He goes bankrupt, he decides to screw you over, whatever, right? But we all know if the U.S. government goes bankrupt, we've all got way bigger problems. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> <For sure. laughs> the entire yeah. economy is yeah. gone and your money's worthless. The world's economy. The, yeah. the world's economy is gone and all the money's worthless. Yeah. So there is no safer investment than investing in funding a government contract. Yep. Um, so we have connections for funding government contracts, which uh, through our experience in the business uh, and our our um, our history of doing government contracts, we've developed this. But someone who's just starting out, an investor may look at them and say, "Well, you have no experience. How do I know you're going to manage this well? How do I know that uh, uh, you know who are you?" <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I get a uh, hundred people calling me up every day, randomly asking me for money. Why should I give it to you? Right? So. By us building War Dogs Academy and creating a community, the, um, our investors we know that these people have the best possible training, the best possible likelihood of delivering successfully on the contract. And if our students uh, follow our program and learn how to set this up correctly, we can help them get financing, and which is an enormous leg up to uh, actually successfully launching a government contracting career. It'll shorten the timeline for success and reduce the, um, the risks associated uh, with someone just starting out by a, a tremendous amount. And so that is, and of course, from our perspective, um, we want to make our, our students as successful as possible because the more successful our students are, the more students we're gonna get. It's going to be a, uh, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Nobody cares what you say. They care about results. Yep. They want to know, are people succeeding? Are people actually doing it? And um, I have this amazing story that got turned into a Hollywood film that people know about. You guys are in the trenches and have been for the past five, six years, uh, and you're up to date on all the uh, latest uh, government contracting requirements. And uh, so we thought it was a great partnership to start and uh, build a community of people to, uh, to uh, help people get into this business. And uh, we're really excited about that, uh, getting that going. And not only is it gonna, or are we gonna help people uh, achieve wealth and build businesses and build lives out of this. But from a macro standpoint, this is going to create, um, it's going to bring in a lot of new, new players into the market. And when there's new players in the market, there's more competition, right? Uh, and when there's more competition, the government is going to get a better price because they're you're going to have to compete with other people. And as you guys have seen, and I've seen this too, we all know that there are certain niches in government contracting where there are some old players there who are very comfortable and they have been making money in the same way yeah. for decades sometimes and they have absolutely zero uh, incentive to be competitive because they don't really have any competitors. Very complacent. And very complacent. And it just takes a young war dog to come in who's <laughs> young and hungry and they can eat their lunch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what you guys have done. Absolutely. And, that, and that's what we did. Yeah. We ate G General Dynamics lunch. Mm -hmm. General Dynamics, a multi-billion dollar publicly mm -hmm. traded company, 
was expecting to win the Afghan LHD, contract. LHD, we ate your lunch. Sorry yeah. for taking that contract from you. Um, yeah, yeah, it's absolutely true. Um, yeah. There's many contracts that we have won just from companies that they've had the contract for 10 years. Mm-hmm. They've been running it. They are not doing anything advantageous for the government anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just focusing on getting their profit and getting out. Exactly. And um, we come in there and like, listen, we'll do that and we'll do this and that mm-hmm. even we'll more. We'll go above and beyond. Exactly. And um, the government is, they're always excited to see young, ambitious people in the field because they're not used to it. Exactly. And so it's a breath of fresh air for them. And, you know, they get the best services mm-hmm. and we get, you know, we get money. Profit, lots of money. You know? Yeah, we get money. So you'd be surprised at how many are willing to give to these young, ambitious guys because, mm-hmm. you know, we're willing to do more. Exactly. And a lot of these CEOs are willing to take a chance on younger companies. Yeah. You know? yeah. We've had CEOs tell us that, mm-hmm. that you guys seem young and hungry, like, yeah. You know, we're going to we're going to let you guys prove yeah. yourself. Absolutely. Because they know it's in their own best yeah. interest. Mm-hmm. They know that that government has a terrible reputation of wasting money. Right. There's a. Uh, uh, lots of famous stories out there of uh, you, they pay like six hundred dollars for a roll of toilet uh, yeah, paper, or or, uh, <laughs> or uh, NASA spent like two million dollars on a pen that can write in space and stuff like yeah. that. And there's and the reason for that is is lack of competition. Yeah. When when you're when you know that the government will pay you whatever you ask for, you ask for a lot, mm-hmm. right? I mean that's that's human nature. I don't I don't blame anyone for doing that, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that's why government has such a terrible reputation of wasting money is because there are these pockets uh, in the things that they buy and the services that they buy that people have gotten complacent. They realize the lay of the land. There's no new competitors coming in to shake them up and to keep them on their toes. And so the price over the years creeps higher and higher and higher. Their margins get fatter and fatter and fatter. And eventually the government is paying ridiculous amounts of money and wasting all our taxpayer dollars. And everyone's Mm -hmm. complaining, you know, why can't the government afford to give us this and that and the other thing? And why are they having to tax us so much? And, uh, and the reason is because it's inefficient. And so if we could play even a small part in, uh, in doing that, that's just a win, win, win for everybody. It's Absolutely. a win. It's a win for our students primarily, which mm-hmm. is, of course, our number one goal is to help create a new generation of war dogs uh, to to uh, um, make lives uh, for better for themselves and their families and provide a living uh, for the long term. But it's also a win for the taxpayer, which is all of us. We Absolutely. all pay our taxes. And the more money you make, the more taxes you pay Absolutely. and the more it hurts. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, we'll help you get those taxes. Exactly. back. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So being able to make that money back and doing it in a way that saves the government money. And hopefully if it's well managed, big if, uh, that they will use those th- savings, something that will benefit the rest, all, all of us as well. Uh, that's just a win for everybody, or just lower our taxes. You know, yeah. that's, we're, we're that's, saving our communities. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> we're, we're, we're heroes. We're heroes. We're heroes. <laughs> I wouldn't call us that. <laughs> Superheroes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's so that's the plan. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, get a whole new breed of war dogs out there, a new yep. generation who are young, hungry. Uh, don't, don't have to be young, could be any age, mm-hmm. hungry and ambitious. There's no age to a war dog. Exactly. You can be an old dog, you can be a young dog, as long as you're hungry, as long as you go after it, uh, yeah. then you can succeed. And we're going to make your chances of success significantly higher yes. and uh, reduce your chances of mistakes and all the wasted time and wasted money that we all experience. Learn from our mistakes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A, wise, a wise man learns from others' mistakes. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, that that I think that pretty much wraps yeah. it. That's, yeah. That was great. Perfect. That was awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, David, for yeah. being on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I guess it. what yeah. a story. I guess you'll be <laughs> you. kind of our. Thank are you. you our co-host or what do we? I call mean, you? I think we're like co-host. co-host? Like, I think we're all. All right, David. Thanks for yeah. <laughs> being at your own show. I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, now for yeah, the I second mean, segment, we're going to be taking off our shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Come to our OnlyFans for the, oh uh, the hot tub podcast. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, that, that's only for the premiere membership. <laughs> if you join our Patreon, yeah, yeah, exactly. you will find us without shirts. <laughs> David's jacked and we're just like... <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. David, yeah. that, se- that last